Yes. Okay, um, welcome to this evening's meeting of the Board of Education. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order and start with the roll call, please. Penny Kazmir. Here. Sandra Bradford. Here. Angela Wilcox. Here. Gavin Newman. Here. Mike Shackleton. Here. Barry Altshuler. Here. Leah Collister Lazari. Here. Thank you. Um, if everyone would like to stand and join us in the pledge, we're gonna ask Dr. Harris to lead us, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Harris. We are excited this evening to do the high school recognition of some of our highest achieving academic students. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a presentation prepared tonight. I think board members know that in typical circumstances, um, we usually have quite a few visitors at, our, at this board meeting. Obviously, we're doing this virtual tonight. I know each of them and their families are watching at home, so we've uh, let them know that we recognize them this evening. Um, but I am going to, at this point, turn it over to Steve McWilliams, principal of Barrington High School, and let him talk about the students that we're recognizing this evening. Steve? Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Harris. It uh, is my pleasure to recognize uh, a number of students this evening. We're going to start off um, with um, a recognition, recognition of uh, students that have earned um, a 36 on the ACT and wow. one perfect ACT score. So uh, for those of you that are not familiar with it, um, the ACT is one of the college qualifying exams and to score a, a 36 is um, certainly amongst uh, the, the top um, students in the nation uh, are, are represented in that category. Um, so uh, our first uh, first student is Bed Anad, and I'm letting um, our next student is Arjun Azja. And then we have Rajesh Balasami. And then we have Benjamin Meitzler. And then we have Ashna Patel. Now, <clears throat> a little extra um, recognition to Ashna. Um, she had a perfect 36. So her composite score was, uh, the, the others had a 36 composite, which means they may have gotten one question or two questions wrong. Ashna had a perfect score, which means she obviously had zero wrong on her test. Then we have Ria Sharma. And then Tarun, Burunga, sorry, Burugunanti. So those are our perfect ACTs for the year. Um, so typically, Brian, as you know, and board members, we have a, 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 about three to four a year. So um, this is a, a, a huge accomplishment for us, much like it was for our um, students that um, um, scored well in the National Merit Scholarship Program as well. So congratulations to all of those students and uh, certainly a well-deserved recognition amongst the top students in the, uh, not only the state of Illinois, but in the nation and, and actually throughout the world. And then finally, we have one other recognition. We haven't had um, uh, an all-state academic team member in quite a few years, but this year we have Anna Mae King. Anna Mae King was a diver and uh, she was also a basketball player at um, Barrington High School. So uh, Anna Mae, um, uh, in order to qualify for this as, as one of 26 um, student athletes throughout the state of Illinois, um, you have to be a multi-sport athlete and 
um, represents through um, great um, athletics as well as superior academics. So um, great test scores, great GPA. Uh, this is uh, quite an accomplishment for anime. I think um, we've had um, we we have not had an all state academic all state um, uh, student athlete for um, several years. So it's great to to have that accomplishment. Unfortunately, because of um, the world of COVID that we live in right now, we didn't get an opportunity to celebrate with anime. But um, certainly, um, when you see anime in, in uh, the coming weeks and uh, have an opportunity to congratulate her, um, this is a, a another outstanding accomplishment uh, that we're very proud of. So to all of our seniors um, being recognized tonight, congratulations. Um, we look forward to uh, celebrating you once again in just about a week and a half on the 29th at graduation and um, throughout uh, the next few weeks here. Thank you for the time. So any board members, uh, any comments or uh, additional thoughts? Uh, it's always wonderful to recognize the outstanding students we have. Just congratulations to all of you. Huge accomplishments. I wish we were there to say it in person. Ditto. Congratulations. Awesome job. You make us very proud. Congratulations. Really, really amazing. Good job. Yeah, we wish we could celebrate with you in a different way, but here we are. But we really are proud of you. So thank you. Okay, thank you, um, Steve, for that presentation and for keeping us in the loop. Um, our next agenda item is our high school rep, Emma, and Emma has brought a guest this evening as well. Yes, so I brought Isabel. She's going to be my replacement next year um, because I'm graduating. Uh, so she's a rising junior. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Emma, do you have any um, words of wisdom for us or reflections on your time as the board rep is? Um, well, I'll start by saying thank you. I got um, a like, surprise. You guys gave me cookies today and that was really cool. Um, it was a good surprise. Um, so that was fun. I went to the high school today to do the graduation and check out. Um, and that was good. I think it was set up really nicely um, to get to walk the halls one more time and just kind of see a good part of the school again one more time was cool. And it was um, a good order of things to go through and it moved well. So that was really cool. Um, yeah, I would say just stay in the loop. It was easy. It was fun. <laughs> well, any... Um... What about reflections on just your time at the high school? Um, it was a really, really good four years. It's been tough being at home and away from my friends, especially. I know like yesterday was a special day and this weekend was supposed to be prom weekend and looking forward for graduation should have been in two weeks and our last day was supposed to be Friday. So it's, it's tough not being with my friends right now, but um, I have a lot of younger siblings, so it's fun being around them. And I, I know everyone is of dealing it with it in their own way. So looking back on the time I did have in high school was really special and, and everything I got to do this year, even like Philly football and um, choir concerts, we had three out of the four this year. So it was a it was a really special senior year. It just was cut a little short, but all in all, it was a really good four years at BHS. Well, you have left large shoes to fill and um, welcome to Isabel. Um, anything you're looking forward to next year is in this role? Um, I don't know, just, you know, experience, <laughs> I don't know. looking forward to meet you all, you know, <laughs> in person would be good in person, right? <laughs> in person. Well, well, thank you for agreeing to do this. And, um, I don't know, Emma, any last words that you'd like to share with us? Thank you all for a really good year. Um, I'm sad that it had to end on Zoom and not in person, but it was it was a good couple months. Well, when you when we are able to meet again in person, you are always welcome to join us. Um, let us know you're coming, and um, I just Janine, if you could just share your your slide, I I wanted to share with everyone 
our little gift to Emma. And, you know, Emma is, has, has something in mind after she leaves Barrington High School and she is going to be attending Miami University. And I'm sure I'm continuing to make her parents and all of us here in Barrington very proud there. So we wish you a lot of luck and we have enjoyed spending time with you, um, whether it be on Zoom or in person. And um, we just want to know how much we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to spend some time with us. Other board members want to say anything? Just wishing you well at Miami. Thank you for sharing with us your insights into uh, BHS over the last years. Yes, congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Have a good summer. Thank you. Too. <laughs> I would just say I'm not sure I would go out after eating those cookies with that red frosting because <laughs> food coloring may give you some lipstick effect there. So be careful. <laughs> anyway, um, we will look at you. We will look for you when we watch the graduation um, video. Typically, you're missing out on one of the fun things that we usually do. Usually the board stands up and kind of high fives those <laughs> favorite seniors and the, your position is always one of them. So we're going to virtual high five you and wish you well. Thank you so much. And Isabel, Thank we look forward you. to spending more time with you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah. Moving on with our agenda. And you guys don't have to stay unless of course you really want to. Moving on with our agenda, um, my report. Um, I guess I, I um, just wanted to remind the board that we've been invited to share um, congratulatory videos as part of the graduation video. And I think right now, um, Brian only has one. So the deadline for those were our Friday, correct, Friday? Yeah, we so, have to have them this Friday. So please do it tomorrow or we'll be chasing you. And you know, it would help up front if you know that you're not gonna have time to do it or you're unable to do it, if you would just let me know. So then um, Brian doesn't have to follow up on us. So if you already know you're not going to be able to do one for one reason or another, please just let me know offline. It would be great. Or let Brian know. Okay. Um, the only other thing I thought, you know, we've enjoyed um, Emma's company. And I know that we all wish we could be at graduation because it is a fun night. But, um, you know, we have fifth graders. We have kindergartners. We have eighth graders. Um, little Broncos, you know, all, all people transitioning from one level to another in our district. And um, I just wanted to say congratulations to all of, to anyone celebrating. So that's all I had. Um, at this time, um, we've set aside time for public comment. As in past meetings, I am here at the administrative office in case someone wanted to come in person to speak and we've set up an opportunity for someone to call in and leave a voicemail. There is nobody here and nobody has left a voicemail so we can declare public comment closed and move right on to Dr. Harris's report. Okay, I'm queuing it up here. All right, I'm gonna uh, begin this evening. Uh, I've got several items uh, to talk about as we close out the end of the school year. Um, I do want to focus on uh, a couple key items. One special recognition that I want to start with this evening is uh, I've asked uh, Bridget Tileson, our director of K-12 Fine Arts, as well as Ben Rodriguez, who's the one of the assistant principals at Barrington High School, to join me this evening. And they are going to give a brief presentation about the um, Barrington High School Creativity Lab. And this was something that was put together over the last several months uh, and proposed to the Education Foundation. Uh, and the Education Foundation actually 
agreed at their last meeting to donate $30,000 toward the creation of this space. But they did such an outstanding job in their proposal to the Ed Foundation. I asked them to share it tonight with the board. And uh, now, Bridget and Ben, you are there, correct? We're here, yes. Are you going to do a quick slideshow or are you just going to talk from this slide? We're going to do a quick slideshow. So, Ben, I think you can go ahead and All right, I'm going to exit screen. out then. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, first of all, thank you so much to the Educational Foundation. We're so uh, grateful that they chose this project and we're so excited about it. And we're going to tell you a little bit about the rationale behind the project and some of the details tonight. Um, so the BHS Creativity Lab um, is a project that's going to happen in the library um, and will service all of the students at BHS and all of the departments at BHS. Um, the rationale behind the lab is that school's changing. Um, so the way in which you and I experienced education, um, sitting, receiving knowledge, perhaps showing, that, demonstrating that knowledge through a test or through um, a paper, the world is a little bit different now. It's more project-based, more inquiry-based, as we all know, and we're seeking to prepare students for 21st century skills that employers are looking for. Um, so the idea behind um, the Creativity Lab is we're trying to give students a space and materials, equipment, where they can practice some of these 21st century skills that are listed here on the slide. Um, so employers um, say that these 12 skills are the most important to them as young people enter the workforce. Critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, communication, information literacy, media literacy, technology, demonstrating flexibility, leadership, initiative, um, productivity, and then positive social skills. And as we move into talking about the lab, we'll touch on how the lab helps students to develop all of these skills. Um, so an overall vision statement for the Creativity Lab is that it will allow students to explore visual, aural, and artistic mediums in a state-of-the-art facility with industry standard equipment. Um, so Ben is going to explain how some of the unique qualities of the lab can support this type of future-ready learning um, that we're looking for in students. And it's a, it's a drop-in lab, classes, departments can sign it out um, and bring students into the lab to prepare them for some of these inquiry-based and project-based experiences that we're really excited about. Um, and now Ben's going to tell you a little bit more about the lab. Yes, yeah, so this draft here um, kind of gives an idea, an idea of what the lab will look like. Over here on the bottom right corner of the image, you're going to see a full Mac lab, which will allow all students access to uh, professional level Macs to give them access to those industry standard software that allow them to create projects at a high level. Now, on the left side of the draft, you're going to see more of a maker space where you'll have flexible seating, um, tabletops, um, flexible stools, which will be equipped with industry standard equipment that students can use to make projects at a high level. Now, the, some of the inspiration for those tools came from the Everyone Can Create professional development series that we're working through as a district uh, via Apple. Now, we took consideration from professionals when selecting the equipment that the lab will be equipped with but we also wanted to really mirror the learning that our teachers are doing as well. So the equipment that students will be interacting with will be focused on those four key mediums of drawing, photography, video, and music. So what does this look like or what are ways that this lab can really support student learning? Well, there are, we, there are many examples that could happen, but we wanted to just pick a few that you might be interested in. So one example could be how students develop communication and creativity and their ceramics class. If a student's creating an electronic portfolio, they could use the light box and digital camera, both industry standard equipment, to create a portfolio that is not only academically rigorous, but also that could mirror a professional studio's quality level of work. So there's a lot of different ways that this lab could be used and we try to make it really flexible for our students, but we hope that you kind of see that there's a wide variety of ways that students can use this to support their learning. 
And essentially, we want to kind of convey the idea that this lab can be a part of the bridge that connects that high rigor academic work and the professional skills that they're going to be needing in their future. Thanks for your time. So we are excited, you know, about this opportunity. Uh, I know Steve has allocated some building funds to help support this. Uh, we're going to obviously remodel a current classroom and um, and the foundation, as I mentioned, generally generously contributed to the development of this space. So when we return in the fall, whenever uh, that space will be available for students and uh, we're excited about it. It's just such a neat opportunity. Just want to pause here before I go on to a couple of our items to see if there's any question from board members about this particular item. I know uh, it's a unique, kind of a isolated, unique thing, but I, it's just kind of cool. And uh, really uh, stepping out as we always have done in a, across our district and especially at Barrington High School, but unique experiences for our kids. Any questions about that? Did you say it was going to be in the library or a, a separate classroom? So oh, it, it is going to be in the library. There was a, a more traditional computer lab that was in there before, but we're making it more into a maker space um, and, uh, you know, bringing in those creative uh, industry standard equipment pieces that all students can utilize. I think the board actually approved the Mac computers, the desktop. I think there were desktop computers for this earlier in this year. And so this is sort of bringing this all together. Correct. And if I, I just add one thing, I was there when we presented to the foundation and they were, they were very excited and questions range from, um, you know, how does a student access this to, I mean, they were even hopeful that maybe at some point something like this could be in the middle school where middle school students could access it as well. So there was a lot of excitement there. Could we see the second to last slide, um, Ben? Just, I think it was Ben. Yeah, yeah, here, just a second. Let me uh, pull up the screen again here. Right here. So in our original presentation to the foundation, we kind of told a story of a high school junior who might use the lab. And we try to give a kind of a narrative of what the students week looked like while using the lab to, in all these different classes. So ceramics, business incubator, US history and intro to healthcare were the courses that we selected. But we try to make this space as flexible that can fit across the curriculum, no matter what class the student is taking. So we had a little bit more time um, when we presented to the Educational Foundation. And like Ben said, we talked, we just gave specific classes and how it could be used to, to sort of make it more tangible um, to understand. Yeah, I, I told him due to time tonight, uh, try to keep it short. So there was a, there was probably a 20 to 25 minute presentation to the foundation. That's great. Thank you. Do other schools have something like this or colleges even? From my, my understanding, a few colleges do have similar spaces. Mm -hmm. um, and a, a few high schools are working on making their libraries a little bit more maker along that maker space idea. But we really wanted to make this unique to, the high, to our high school students so that way they can see the integration of these tools within the, the classes that they're taking right now. It's really exciting, thanks. And it's nice that it can be available to so many students. Thank you. All right, if there's no further questions, I'm gonna jump back into a couple other items I have here this evening. Um, I also on the personnel agenda this evening, we have two administrative recommendations for hire. Um, uh, I just want to talk about each one of them here during my report. When we get to that portion in the agenda, I'll ask each of them to just say a couple words. Um, first, I'd like to uh, show a little information about Phil Hines. Phil will be our new Director of Student Information. He will be uh, joining us uh, with a wide range of background and experience. We are excited to have Phil join our IT team. Uh, thanks to Matt Fuller and, and his team for uh, both recruiting and, and uh, selecting Phil and recommending him for this position. 
Uh, he will be replacing June Nillis, who is, works uh, in the IT department, uh, extremely key role for us, uh, working with our infant campus software, as well as uh, our transportation routing and all of, uh, a lot of other major software applications, which during the last couple months has been a very, very critical function in our district to allow learning to continue in 220. So a little bit of uh, you know professional background about Phil um, and, and where he's been, and we're certainly glad to have him join us. Also, I'd like to introduce Zach Ernst. Zach uh, is a recommendation to be new, the new principal at Huff Elementary. Um, Zach participated also in a rigorous interview process. Um, and uh, I, I understand uh, from my text message here a little while ago that almost the entire Huff staff and probably some parents are watching at home tonight. So uh, Zach, they're, they're with you uh, virtually here. And I know they're gonna be reaching out to you individually pending board approval here this evening. But um, you know, he did go through the interview process in the Zoom format, which we've all become accustomed to here. I have to admit to you, it's the first time I've participated in an interview process through Zoom. Although the final interview, I did have him join us, um, uh, join me and meet with me here in the office. And I had to meet him face to face before we finalized everything. Uh, we kept our social distance, all the appropriate uh, things in place, but uh, certainly great to meet Zach in person as well. A little bit about his background and experience, got his master's degree in ed leadership from American College of Education, also North Central uh, with a master's and a bachelor's degree as well from North Central. And again, uh, welcome Zach. And I know you've got a big fan group out there. And both uh, Phil and Zach, I'll wait and let you comment uh, when we get to that point in the agenda here in just a few minutes. Um, I would like to go ahead and move forward and spend a few more minutes in my report updating the board on the current situation in the school district. Um, and I want to start with, uh, first of all, end of the year activities. Real quick, this time of the year, I normally give the board an update on all the amazing things we have going on in the district as we close out the school year. That is all happening virtually and differently this year. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, we have a lot of celebrations, as Penny mentioned in her report this evening, uh, going on among our schools. Um, the last day of new instruction for students will be this Friday, May 22nd. The last day for staff will be next Thursday, May 28th. We are gonna use the final three professional development days of the year, working with staff, tying up uh, th this school year under these unique circumstances, and also spending time preparing for next school year. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a minute. Uh, next Tuesday night at 7 p.m., both uh, Prairie and Station will have their eighth grade recognition assemblies being streaming live. So for those of you out there that have eighth grade students, you will be viewing that virtual ceremony and recognition assembly uh, at that time. And then uh, a video uh, version of that will be available on the website. And finally, our last event of this school year will be Barrington High School's graduation, which will be taking place next Friday night, May 29th, regular time, different location. Um, It'll be at 7 p.m. We will stream it live. We are anticipating the event to go be going on for about the regular time that we um, actually have typically done. About two and a half hours is what we're estimating. Um, as I have said, we have worked extremely hard uh, personalizing this event for our high school seniors. Um, over the last two days and a few more tomorrow, we have had every senior into Barrington High School uh, participating in a series of events that Emma briefly commented on a few minutes ago. Uh, Mother Nature cooperated with us today. Uh, we just had a little bit of rainfall this afternoon, but uh, it's been great. Everybody has been extremely cooperative uh, with that, both parents and students. Uh, while certainly different than what any of us ever imagined, uh, they all walked across the stage, as you will see in the graduation. They all flipped their tassel from one side to the other and getting their uh, time, and, uh, and you'll see it in full production on the 29th at 7 p.m. And that's why, board members, it's important that we see you and, and your uh, role as well, so please get us those videos. Just one more plug for that. It'd be a great addition uh, to this ceremony. Um, we uh, 
Also, uh, you know, following the exact same format we always follow. I want to give a quick shout out to Steve and his staff. They have just done an outstanding job. Uh, Matt Fuller, uh, I'm going to give you a kudos right up front. Matt is in production. Board members, you know that when Matt puts something together, it's second to none. And I know he's working hard on it. Uh, and uh, it's going to be a top-notch, uh, you know, recognition assembly and graduation ceremony for our students. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that. And we are excited about uh, streaming that live on Friday, May 29th. Um, I, would, I do want to talk about a couple other items. Uh, as the board is aware, we did a parent survey, we did a student survey, and we did a staff survey uh, about the instruction that's been going on since May, or I'm sorry, since March 13th. Um, while we know it has been not perfect, uh, we have seen uh, quite a bit of feedback uh, through these surveys. Uh, board members, you, you got a detailed report uh, in your day, weekly update that provided a summary of that. I'm going to have John Breesh jump on now for just a minute and uh, provide a, a brief summary of that information uh, that was provided to the board. John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Brian. Hope everyone's doing well tonight. <clears throat> um, yeah, so you, you have a detailed report, and I just want to highlight uh, you know, several of the key areas. As you know, we, we surveyed the teachers. As you may recall, we surveyed the teachers way back when this first started on, on March 24th. And then since then, we, 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 from that data and from the information that's been compiled, uh, feedback that we've been receiving from the community, from, from staff, from students, we compiled a, uh, we put together a more detailed uh, student survey, which you've seen some of the results of. And then from that, we were able to glean some better, a few other questions as well to ask parents. And then we put together another more detailed uh, second teacher survey that went out on May 7th. So um, got quite a bit of information and it, and it has really helped us with a couple of the key areas that we're looking to do as Brian alluded to um, in the planning for the end of this year and then getting our springboard into next year over the summer. Um, so wanted to just highlight a few of the key areas that, uh, that, that drew our attention as a staff um, of some of the areas from the student parent and second teacher survey. Um, that showed some co continuity between all three and some areas of discontinuity. So it appears that staff development and distance learning is an area that will need emphasis moving forward. And we kind of knew that, but it, it rang loud and clear from, from uh, especially the, the parents and the teachers. They, they want more training and we're going to provide that um, to, become, to become more comfortable with uh, implementing distance learning in a digital format. <clears throat> Additionally, um, the way we approach social emotional learning, as we've talked about, appears to be working really well for younger students, but uh, we have begun to re-examine our efforts for middle and high school students as we begin to plan for next year as well. Not that it isn't important, but the way we dedicate time and how we incorporate it, we think um, can be a little more seamless and a little more, uh, uh, and a little, uh, more built into what, what a regular structure would be. Um, additionally, parents and teachers uh, need more time to acclimate to distance learning. Um, we're, we're, we're seeing even more and more, and we've always known this, that communication between the stakeholders is important. So what we're doing is uh, we're going to focus on targeted communications um, about what our efforts, expectations, and students' performance will look like. And then we'll try to engage the parents in the fall to help them understand what instruction will look like in a digital format. So that's kind of really great information that we gleaned from the survey. Um, Another area that was really important to us is we wanted to know how has engagement gone for the students and, and what have the parents' perceptions and teachers' perceptions of engagement been. And I would say that overall throughout the district, um, engagement and instruction um, has been really strong. Um, there's been universal agreement from all groups that staff should continue to use um, some asynchronous area, some asynchronous ways of, of instruction, whether it be pre-recorded. Uh, and live drop-in access, so that would be synchronous for lessons. Um, and again, although there has been relatively strong agreement between teachers and students, there does appear uh, to be a little bit of divergence when it comes to um, the methodology employed in the instruction during distance learning. So the majority of students and teachers tend to favor asynchronous instructional practices like pre-recorded lessons and self-paced instructions. Um, parents tend to be more comfortable with engagement associated with synchronous, that's that face-to-face -face Zoom type model instruction that looks more like 
a traditional model that many of us grew up with. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, in the fall, we'll be strengthening all of our instructional models to promote better agreement between all three groups um, and increase our student engagement, which is always our, our effort, whether we're in regular school, distance learning, or some sort of hybrid. Um, we want to focus our efforts in the summer to really shoring up our instructional models in distance learning. Uh, and then we want to build, once we feel like we are, those are in a good place, um, we really want to take this, this information that we've gleaned from the surveys um, and build some, you know, parent, parent universities to help them, help us to engage with them in these instructional models, help them to become more comfortable with them, while also providing greater structure in the fall for instruction at all levels. So that's just a summary. Um, there's some really, it was some, it was really, really good information and it couldn't have been more timely because we're planning our summer universities for staff. Uh, we're planning on how we use our summer curriculum hours to uh, provide staff development, rewrite curriculum. And so having this information couldn't, be, couldn't have been more critical for how we hone our efforts in those areas. So um, that's sort of my brief summary. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Let me jump in here and, and let me uh, kind of close up my comments. And certainly I'll answer any questions that board members may have. I do want to jump on one of the things that John commented on. I want to talk about the start of 21, uh, 2021 school year as my final component here. Um, you know, obviously, as the school year closes next week, uh, we're going to immediately shift to start thinking about what school is going to look like on August 20th. Um, the first and foremost, right now, we have no idea. Um, and I've said that before. Uh, I think as we've learned over the last two months, we are going to have to be extremely flexible. We're going to have to be ready for the unknown, whatever that may look like when we uh, prepare for that. Um, I was on a conference call yesterday with the State Board of Education, State Superintendent, uh, and, and a few other superintendents around the state. Um, and the State Superintendent shared with us that uh, she is anticipating a guidance document coming out from the state. Uh, in conjunction with the Illinois Department of Health on June 1st, if somewhere around June 1st, uh, to superintendents. And in that document, while I don't know the details of it, it will have significant guidance for us on what we will be required to do to start school next year. Again, I had shared previously, uh, we're preparing for three different scenarios. One is school as normal, where we would open having all staff and students return to our buildings. Now, as I said, we're going to have significantly different protocols, even if we're in that mode. It's absolutely going to be the case, given our new norm. Uh, the other end of the spectrum will be if, if we're still in a distance learning format, uh, if the information still is not appropriate for us to be back to normal, uh, which we've just done for the last two and a half months. That would be the other model. And as John mentioned, we're certainly going to be preparing. We're going to be in a different mode on August 20th than we have been for the last two and a half months. Grades will be in a different cycle. Instruction's gonna be uh, certainly in a different place. Um, we'll be at the beginning of a school year and not in the final quarter of a school year. It'll be a different set of circumstances no matter what. And finally, if there's some type of hybrid situation where we will have a mix of in-person and blended learning uh, situation where we may have some students at school and some staff at the facilities, we may have them in a, at home and, and in, a, in, a, in a varied environment. So again, uh, as we prepare these plans, we are gonna have to be very agile. Uh, we're gonna have to be able to uh, develop plans. Uh, we're gonna have to validate them, uh, making sure that they, they uh, cross all the T's, dot all the I's. And then we're gonna have to be able to monitor and modify extremely quickly. Uh, depending on what the circumstances are. I am concerned, regardless of how we start on August 20th, uh, what will it look like in November? You know, what's going to happen in the winter months if we don't have a vaccine yet? Um, when the cold and flu season, you know, is upon us as it is in every winter time. Um, you know, we, we've got a significant set of challenges in front of us for the 2021. It's not all about August 20th. Certainly we'll be prepared for August 20th. But I am also concerned about what school is going to look like on December 1st, uh, what it's going to look like on February 1st. Um, and I think we're going to have to be extremely flexible. So um, I will certainly keep the community and the board updated 
uh, as well as our staff on the decisions as they begin to play out. Um, as I said, um, you know, we, we have not got anything in concrete form at this point. We're going to wait on the guidance from ISBE, and then we will start to firm up our plans and the direction we're going to head uh, as we think about the 2021 school year. So I'm going to stop here and um, jump back in here to the full screen mode and answer any questions. I know it was a lot, but uh, certainly want to answer any questions board members have. Um, I, I have two questions. The first is what kind of response did you get from parents in terms of, you know, percentage of parents who were asked to, to uh, answer the survey? Uh, was it a good, you know, representative number or were we wanting maybe more feedback than we got? John, go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question, um, Barry. We, we got about, um, we, we did get a good number of parents. I think we got, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think by the time we all, it was all said and done about eight, a little over 1800 parents. So, um, and remember that that could be, um, you know, a single parent filling it out or it could represent an entire household. So um, we, we felt like that was pretty representative when we looked at, broke down which, which areas they were, they were um, representing, whether it was, you know, ELC elementary, middle or high school, we, we felt like we had a good represent, representative sample on, on all levels as well. You know, statistically speaking, uh, I think the sample was a good sample size. The N was, you know, very predictable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Is, is there still a forum for parents who want to, you know, pr provide more feedback? Is there still some formal or informal way for them to add their two cents? I, I, I just have a, a couple neighbors who either missed the email or have been too busy to answer and still feel like they want to share opinions. I'm just wondering if there's a forum to, to provide that. Well, I would say that, I, to my knowledge, I think the survey is actually still open, so they can still they can still take it if they like. Good to know. Okay, John, is that posted on our website, or was it a push communication through email? Correct. It, it was a push communication. I think it, there was a link also pushed out in Samantha's. Uh, what was it? A week and a half ago, as well. So it's it's out there. Um, and if anyone needs it, I'm certainly more that they can email me directly, and I'm more than happy to send it to them. You know, tonight, uh, when Samantha puts out her board notes tomorrow morning, Samantha, we'll just add that link again so parents can grab it there if they don't can't find the email that was pushed. So. I appreciate you doing this. As a, as a parent of a sophomore in high school, um, it's nice to hear that a parent university is a good idea. More communication is always welcome. It was just an awful lot of changes and different things and hard to figure out as a parent, even one who pays it, thinks she pays attention. You know, it was, it was a moving target as far as what grades were and how it was working. So thanks again. Any hey, other Brian, questions? Hey, Brian, the, yeah, the only question I have is, is once we get back to a new normal, whatever that may or may not be, when we have dual working parents, and we might have uh, kind of a split blended uh, environment. How do we plan on handling that when we have dual working parents who have responsibility being in the office? It's gonna be an extremely uh, difficult challenge, Gavin. I know that exact question is being vetted out at the state level right now, because that's not uh, alone just in this community. It's in every community across the state. Um, it's a major concern, I think, in the return to work situation that the governor is dealing with. Um, and I know there is significant conversations about what that could look like. I think, I, I believe the best way I can answer at this point, I think there's going to be a regional coordination of that effort across the state. Okay. Um, that's what I'm, <laughs> I'm advocating for as one superintendent, you know, here in the Northwest suburban area of Chicago. Um, and I, I, as you know, I've, I do have a seat at the, that, in that conversation right now with the, with the governor's team and with ISBE, um, and, and it is at the top of the list. Um, I know it's a significant concern for our teaching staff, too. I mean, a lot of them have their kids at home, and it, it's, it's an HR issue in every business, uh, not only our business, but in every occupation, as well as a, a concern of all parents. So I wish I had a better answer for you other than we have to keep that in consideration, no matter what mode we're in. 
truthfully, we're probably going to have to see where our community is sitting as far as the work situation to whether or not we're going to be able to um, do this and whether or not we provide a virtual option for our families, you know, or whether or not, you know, how this is all going to play out. Again, I'm being a little unclear, but there is no path forward yet. And uh, we're certainly going to have to consider it. I hope that helps. So, so my last question is, uh, since we moved our admin office and we're in Cook County, are we deemed a Lake County or Cook County school district? <laughs> well, it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, as far as schools go, we are considered a Lake County school because all of our school district things, you know, all of our certifications, all of our reporting mechanisms, all of our approvals for construction, they all go through the Lake County Regional Office of Education. However, as we found out, as I shared at the last board meeting, uh, when it comes to elections, because of our legal address now being in Cook County, uh, we are uh, considered a Cook County for board elections, just for elections. As far as I know, everything else still goes through Lake County. So we are tied to the Lake County Regional Office of Education. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Great question. As you know, we have one school in Kane County too, Sunny Hills in Kane County. And then we have a small portion of our district with no schools there that are in McHenry County. So Brian, um, to piggyback on Gavin's first point about the kids not being physically at school, some families have a single parent and you know young kids in school um yeah just passing that on this for whatever it's worth in your conversations passing that responsibility on to the parent is not right in my opinion whatever the virtual programming looks like that really needs a close look it really needs to be addressed um it's a big problem if they don't address that part of it i agree i can tell you we have a list of probably 25 to 30 solutions right now some of them are good some of them probably not so good uh no matter what happens we're probably going to rely on some other community partners to help support us and our families if we're in some type of a hybrid mode um i've already had a, a preliminary conversation with our park district I've had a preliminary conversation with the Boys and Girls Club. I've had a preliminary conversation uh, with some of our other support groups in the community. So it's going to be all hands on deck, no matter what the circumstance is, if we're not either all in or all in remote. So, um, you know, we might even have to reposition some of our instructional staff for some supervision scenarios. I mean, I, I don't want to get too far into issues right now until we get a little more guidance from the state sure. uh, and start to put some concepts together, then I will certainly be prepared to share that with the board uh, in the very near future. I appreciate it. And just for what it's worth, if the park district can have groups of kids together, then why can't schools? So, Well, we're all going to be limited in the amount of kids. That's the issue. You know, in, in a typical classroom space, from what I've seen, we're gonna, uh, you know, we're gonna, in, in certain scenarios, we're not gonna be able to have more than 12 kids in a classroom in an elementary space, maybe up to 15 in a high school space. Um, kind of depends on the room. Um, Park District have, will have the same rules. They're all ruled by public health guidelines as well. Uh, churches will have the same rules. Um, you know, no matter who our partners are here, they're gonna have the same protocols. We're, or we're all gonna be following the same scenarios no matter what. So there's talk that 12 together is going to solve a problem that 20 together would not solve. Is that it? It's all about social distancing. Yeah. I'll defer to the experts. Sure That's they're... why I want to wait and see the guidance before I really go too much further. Yeah. This Thank is, you. I have a question on the topic influenced by this um, summer school. What type of enrollment are we seeing in summer school? You know, I'm going to turn that over to Craig. Uh, Craig, I think you might have some information on that. Uh, we have seen, uh, the, the, the quick answer is we have seen a, a little bit of a drop in our summer school enrollment. 
I think because as the board knows, it's all virtual this summer and we're just coming off two and a half months of virtual. I think some people, some kids might be thinking twice about that, need a little break. Uh, that's just my hunch. Uh, but yeah, Craig, are you able to jump in here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have had some conversations. Um, Brian's correct. We have seen a decrease in enrollment across the board at elementary, middle, and high school. Um, I was just talking with Paul Kirk and Heather Schumacher, some of our elementary principals, and um, they're seeing a 50% reduction in classes. So where we may have offered four sections of a particular uh, course in the past, we're seeing maybe one or two sections at this time. Um, I would, you know, hand it over to Steve to talk about any of the courses at the high school level and, and the numbers there. Same thing at middle school, right, Craig? Yes. Similar situation, about 50%. Yeah. Steve at the high school? So, <clears throat> Brian, as you're aware, we, we shifted to um, online virtual classes through Illinois Virtual for many of our um, core area classes. Um, and this is all anecdotal. We don't have the actual numbers from them, but um, I'm seeing um, uh, some some students choose not to do virtual as we would expect, um, you know, based on uh, exactly what Craig said a moment ago. Um, we still we still have strong enrollments in some of our um, elective area classes, um, digital photography, um, some of those classes that we traditionally offer over the summer, um, where um, students have a a little bit of more of a blended format. Um, those are those still seem to be strong, but uh, definitely uh, the health and consumer ed and some of um, uh, the um, credit recovery classes we're seeing some drops. And we know we won't be offering driver's ed this summer. Obviously, we're restricted from doing that behind the wheel. Yes, that is correct. And so, in terms of the finances behind summer school we staff to meet the need, correct? So if, if we had thought we would run six sections and we're only gonna run two. We, we do that every year. Months. We do that every year. We only, we only staff according to the enrollment. And this year it's just obviously gonna be significantly different than what we've experienced in a long, long time. And so Penny, so communication is starting to go out. If we didn't get enough kids, like let's say we only have four students that signed up this year where we would maybe in the past have 12 to 15 students. We've started to notify those families, trying to offer them different courses that are running and trying to sort out those conversations right now. Okay. Thank you. We'll have, a parents, we'll have a gonna... report for the board uh, in June once we you know, get the details and, and it actually starts. Are parents still able to enroll at all levels in summer school? It's John, it's Craig. I believe sections you can still sign up for summer school, yes. That's correct. Okay. Have you, uh, are we educating parents and students on options like Illinois Virtual? Um, or are we just pushing out ours? We are definitely at the high school educating them on Illinois virtual. So, and, and the options that are available there. And that um, enrollment is available um, until June 2nd. Okay. I think they're offering AP classes for the first time ever through summer school, just a few for anyone who wants, is interested in that. And, um, I think they have a longer term to complete a class than we do in case that's attractive to anybody. That is correct, Mike. And we get the same credit, right? That is correct. How's the cost compare? Do we know? An Illinois virtual um, course costs $240 per credit hour. Um, a District 220 summer school course costs $268 per credit hour plus fees. So it is um, um, a little bit cheaper to take the Illinois virtual course. A little. Okay. Thank you. Any there are, just, just to clarify though, um, Mike, there are um, some of the classes where um, um, we try to steer students away from taking um, content or core content area classes during summer. So for instance, 
um, taking U.S. history, and I'm not sure if that's an Illinois virtual class that's offered, an AP U.S. history class through Illinois virtual would not be something that we would recommend because it is a core class. We try to keep core classes taught at the school with our teachers, but there are certainly others that are available. Um, um, AP Econ would be an example. It's not, that's not considered a core, it's considered an elective. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you for your support. Uh, as you know, things change daily and uh, it's gonna continue that way. I'm anticipating between now and August 20th. So um, uh, hang in there and I'll certainly keep the board updated and the community updated as uh, we make some decisions and get some guidance to move forward. Thank you. Is that the end of your report, Brian? Yes, I didn't say my typical phrase. That concludes my report. Just checking. Okay, um, the next thing on our agenda are informational reports. We had none. What about committee reports? Facilities uh, met last week and we discussed the options for developing some of the property um, west of the high school, Cross Heart Road. And there are some interesting options and variables. That we also decided, I think, that those decisions should be considered alongside the referendum development conversation, the timeline and what we're doing there. Um, so, I don't think we have any, we don't have any recommendations yet with, with regard to that. Um, Barry, was there anything else? No, I just wanna piggyback though what you just said, Mike. Um, the concern is when we do start some of the referendum building, uh, specifically at the high school, we're gonna be losing athletic fields. Um, and what Mike Ajbust has said is um, there's been such an interest in sports especially with the spring sports, he doesn't have enough fields as it is. And now we may be losing fields as we do some expansion. For example, the front um, parking lot uh, is gonna be cutting through where the uh, um, lacrosse team is now practicing. And we're gonna be, I think they're looking at moving the tennis courts. And so there's just some issues that we have to deal with. And we have to make sure that we have enough spaces for our young men and women to be practicing. So um, west of Hart Road is going to be a, a, a vital spot. Um, and like I say, it's just in the planning stages, everything's preliminary, but just so the board understands, we're going to need more practice space for our, for our, um, our um, teenagers. Um, and, and, and that's why Hart Road becomes so vital for us. Any other committees? Okay, um, let's move into our consent agenda then. Is there a motion to approve this evening's consent agenda? So moved, Mike. Sandra, second. Okay, um, for the record, this evening's agenda includes exceptions report, a BHS activity report, an NSLP exceptions report, as well as a K-8 activity report from all from April, a bill list from May, a payroll report fiscal year 20, revenues and expenditure report, as well as a treasurer's report. It also includes minutes, both open and closed um, from April 21st. It includes a revised personnel report it also includes consideration to approve Illinois Consolidated District Plan for grant funding. And just as a reminder, we had this on our last agenda, and this is just an approval to release the grants. Um, and the last item as part of our consent agenda is a consideration to approve the ombudsman contract renewal. Are there any questions about any of these items? Okay, seeing none, roll call please. 
Sandra Bradford. Yes. Penny Casmir. Yes. Gavin Newman. Yes. Leah Collister Lazari. Yes. Mike Shackleton. Yes. Angela Wilcox. Yes. Barry Altshuler. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Um, our next. Can we take a minute to let our two new administrators uh, comment? That okay? Yeah, please do. I always forget. So thank you for reminding me. Well, without sitting in the audience like we typically have, it's hard to remember, right? So I'm going to first turn it over to Phil. Phil, I know you've been hanging in there with us. Welcome uh, to 220. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris. I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to work for uh, such an outstanding school district that I've respected for many, many years already. Um, thank you, Dr. Harris. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fuller. And thank you, school board, for uh, allowing me to, uh, to be able to serve you guys and serve the, the community of, of Barrington School District uh, 220. Very excited for this opportunity. Well, as I said in my preliminary comments, we're excited to have you join our team. So welcome. We'll, we'll hit the ground one on July 1st, right? Or even sooner. <laughs> That's right. I like we'll it. Some transition stuff real soon. You betcha. So, excellent. Uh, Zach, I'm also, I'd like to give you just a couple minutes uh, and our new principal at Huff Elementary. Zach, congratulations. Thanks so much. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, very excited to join the uh, the Huff Street family and the District 220 family. Uh, and I, I got uh, my family here wants to say hi. I got my two biggest fans sitting next to me. So uh, wanted to have my wife, Courtney, and my daughter, Parker, say hi. <laughs> and uh, wanted to give a huge shout out really quick. Um, Mr. Jim Alfs has been amazing already. Uh, I wanted to say I'm just so fortunate to be following in the amazing footsteps of uh, a great leader. He's already reached out to me a couple times. We had, we've had some uh, conversations uh, and to hear the amazing things that uh, Huff Street's already accomplished. Uh, I, can, I can only hope to uh, continue uh, to keep uh, Huff Street's community students on that same trajectory and path uh, for continued success and growth. And um, I am probably more excited than words can express to get to start meeting you all and uh, working with everybody. So I know that'll be coming here very shortly, but uh, looking forward to working with everybody. Well, thank you, Zach. And great to see your wife and daughter as well. And big night for dad and, and, and your wife as well. So congratulations. And again, Phil, thank Thanks. you. Uh, it's always an exciting night. I wish we could be in person, but we'll yeah. see you soon, right? Soon. soon. Thank, Thank you, Penny, so for a few minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, guys. And you guys can hang out here, or if you want to go on and be with your families, that's okay, too. Either way, it's just fine with us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Okay. Um, thank you for reminding me. Okay, our next action item is consideration to approve the graduation requirements for the class of 2020. Is there a motion to approve this item? I so move, it's Barry. Sandra, second. Exciting. Um, Dr. Harris, do you wanna just say a few words about this? I do, I had mentioned this uh, uh, last time in my superintendent's report. And uh, tonight I'm asking the board uh, to please approve uh, some uh, reduced graduation requirements uh, related to the conflict we've had here over the last two and a half months. Uh, we just did not want to uh, create any challenges for any of our seniors. And again, I had mentioned a huge majority, 99% of our students are already fine. We did have a few students got caught up in this situation and we did not want to create any challenges because of the uh, circumstances we're in. So really that's what this does. It's explained in the document and I appreciate the board's consideration. Are there any questions? Okay, roll call please. Penny Casmir? Yes. Gavin Newman? Yes. Leah Collister Lazari? Yes. Mike Shackleton? Yes. Angela Wilcox? Yes. Barry Altshuler? Yes. Sandra Bradford? Yes. Motion passed. Our next action item is a consideration to approve the custodial contract renewal. Is there a motion? This is Sandra, so moved. Angela, second. Um, 
Brian, do you want to say something? Would you like to? I will. I'm going to let Dave jump in here real quick, an executive summary of this. This is our annual renewal for food service. Um, and Dave, I'll let you comment briefly on it. So it's not food service. This is the custodial contract. I'm sorry. I was on the wrong item. Custodial. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, we utilize the services of ABM, formerly GCA, over at Barrington High School uh, to do our uh, custodial uh, sorry, uh, yeah, our custodial and some uh, light maintenance work. And uh, we had bid that out uh, four years ago. We are uh, in the uh, the fourth renewal of a five-year uh, contract. And uh, this recommendation um, is brought forward. Um, and the, the ABM has been a good partner. They do quality work uh, for us. Um, and uh, we'd be excited to have them come back for another year um, they are certainly challenged um, as we take a look at uh, finances, um, you know, coming forward this next year as they'll be um, working through some minimum wage increases that are, are mandatory uh, that affect the majority of the employees that they've got on our team. Um, but uh, we're hopeful to have them back uh, for this last year of the existing contract. Any questions from the board? So on the finance committee, do Gavin, you're together a little bit. We're approving a contract now. What does what is it going to look like as we move forward? Gavin, What's I'm up? sorry, that was broke up. We didn't hear anything you said. Say it again. Can you hear me now? Yes. So when we were in the finance committee, we discussed um, as we come back together within the four walls of the school, that contract is going to look a lot different based on utilization of the employees that we have within our custodial agreement. And how can we agree to a contract today with not knowing what that's going to look like moving forward? What we did do in this um, uh, this renewal is incorporate some language that if our schools would be closed, um, that we would not be obligated to pay the contract, uh, so we would not have them working for times if that if that were um, something we would choose to do, uh, so that we would not be obligated to pay for times that we would not need them in service. That was a change since the finance committee discussion, Gavin. Uh, that's on the uh, attachment here. And if can you also speak to um, flexibility about um, job related duties? No, certainly. The, you know, as we have had some opportunities over the last couple months uh, without students and staff in the building, uh, we've been able to engage in a variety of, of cleaning efforts to ensure that our building was going to be ready if students came back during the, the school year. Obviously, that didn't happen. And once we had that indication, um, we got uh, into our normal summer cleaning mode. Um, but we've also been uh, working with ABM to do some additional cleaning around our building, things that we normally don't have uh, the time or the resources to be able to get to. Uh, and we've reviewed um, those. We've had uh, meetings with them, talked about what it is, uh, confirmed that by email on a written form. Um, and those all fall within the scope of what we're currently doing So, and, and what's in our current contract. So we're not asking them to do things that are beyond um, what is contemplated in our existing contract, but they will be doing some things that we normally don't have time for them to do. Um, so uh, we will be able to keep them busy through the end of uh, the summer. Um, if we get into next fall and we're not open for business as normal, um, then we'll want to revisit um, how long we would need their services and may then look to exercise the clause that's in this, um, this renewal uh, that would say we if we're not going to have students and staff in, then we're, we probably don't need to be cleaning the building at that point. And we'll be running out of additional things that, that we want to do. Um, so we wouldn't have them in place. Are there any other questions? Hey Dave, I'm more, I'm more concerned on the flip side where if we have significant more cleaning requirement. Well, if, uh, if we have additional cleaning requirements, you know, that, that requires staff that's above and beyond what we currently have, uh, that would be a conversation with them and then we would need to negotiate that. Uh, typically what would happen is, um, it's contemplated in the agreement is that 
there's a, a charge for additional work beyond um, what is in our current agreement. Um, so either we would then negotiate um, something separate or we would do it on a one-off or, or hourly basis. So we have the ability to open the contract if we want. Right, that would be, a, right, that would be, a, well, we, we can ask for more, they'll charge us for more. So we're protected on the downside and we have the opportunity to ask for more help if we need it. Other questions? Okay, um, roll call please. Gavin Newman? Yes. Leah Collister Lazari? Yes. Mike Shackleton? Mike Shackleton? Do we lose Mike? I think we did. I don't see him. Okay. Angela Wilcox? Yes. Barry Altshuler? Yes. Sandra Bradford? Yes. Penny Casimir? Yes. Motion. Motion passes. Um, the next item on our agenda um, is there a motion to consider to approve the consideration to approve? the Sodexo contract renewal. This is Sandra, so moved. Barry, I'll second. Um, would you like to provide a summary on this as well? Yeah, now my comment's right. This is the Sodexo agreement. Again, it's, uh, this would be year two of a three-year agreement that we uh, signed with Sodexo. Uh, last year, it's the re annual renewal that we're required to do under Illinois state statute and guidelines. Dave, uh, any details you'd like to add on the details? I, I think that uh, there isn't a lot in addition to that. I mean, we, uh, this is a renewal. It's consistent with the, uh, with the contract. Uh, and, and we'll be happy to have Sodexo back and uh, continue to work on um, you know, our food service program. You know, of course, this is a little more complicated um, in trying to figure out exactly what food service will look like this next year. Um, so uh, there's certainly more work to be done with both of our food service providers as we take a look at uh, or understand exactly what next year will bring in terms of uh, service uh, needs and volume. Um, any questions on this? Okay, um, roll call please. Leah Collister Lazari? Yes. Mike Shackleton? Angela Wilcox? No. Barry Altshuler? Yes. Sandra Bradford? No. Penny Casimir? Yes. Gavin Newman? No. Okay. We have a little uh, tie breaker, tie vote here. Um, so the motion does not pass. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Mike because I think his vote would have been important to us. Um, tie, that's for sure. Right. One or the other. Right, right, exactly. Um, okay. For right now, I think we'll just move on from this. And if he joins back on, um, we can, uh, can we vote again? Yes, uh, you can have further discussion. There'd have to be a new motion. Uh, it could be the same, you know, uh, because you do have a tie. So, um, you know, there, there's always the option to do that. Okay. So if okay. Mike rejoins us, um, I don't, I'm not sure what happened. They're going to have to write a new Robert's rules for Zoom meetings. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Due to technical difficulties, yes. Okay. Um, let's move on to our discussion items and I'm going to um, flip our um, order here upside down a little bit. Um, so we're going to start with the, the budget conversation and I just, I'm going to try to set this up a little bit. So um, the board had a special meeting last Tuesday night based on concerns um, related to our budget because of the things going on in um, all of our lives right now. And we looked at how changes in drivers like CPI, tax collection, state funding might impact the budget. Um, tonight we're taking the second step in that process and we're gonna look at our budget assumption sheet. And this is a, 
process that we typically go through at the end of January, beginning of February, which we did this year as well. Um, and we, we use this budget, our assumption sheet as a tool to help us um, determine what our budget might look like. And based on how that turns out, we make decisions in our spending accordingly. So um, that's where we're at tonight. Before we start on this process though, I wanted to ask the board if you had questions about some of the information we've been provided by the administration. So um, we were provided with a um, tax collection history document. Any questions about that? Okay, we were also provided some information in um, Brian's weekly update related to some individual item or individual line items in our assumption sheet. And Brian had some dollars associated with those things. And I guess I would, I would maybe on that one, unless there's quick questions, I ask us to hold off because I feel like um, I'd like to address those as we work through the assumption sheet itself so we can understand which line items we're talking about. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Um, okay, so the, the other reason I flipped the timing of this is I know our original plan was to go over the sheet, um, adjust our assumptions, and then at our next meeting, we were gonna have um, Dave come back to us with what those, what those new um, numbers look like, but instead I've asked if we can work through this now, um, do the referendum construction update discussion item. During that time, Dave's gonna take a break and he's gonna go model these things for us and then he'll come back to us after the food service update and show us where we're at. So hopefully it'll give us a um, head start on where we need to go next. So a little bit of um, background there. Okay, so um, I printed out my assumption sheet. I know you all have an electronic copy and I just thought we should work through this in a similar way that we normally do right after those CPI numbers are published and just going line item by line item. Um, we know what CPI is and I, I'm going to start in the 2021 column. We're, we're currently sitting in the 2020 budget, but we're going to start in the 2021 because that's next year. Um, so um, we know what CPI is. Um, to, so the next, I think, large trigger for us is a tax rate collection. And we saw Dave model some of those um, for us. Now, when I looked back at the, sorry, I have to change screens here. When I looked back at our historical tax collection, I did think that, um, I don't remember who, I think it was Sander requested sort of a historical look at what our tax collections were after 2008, I did think that was helpful. Um, so what do board members think about, about our assumption for tax collection rate? Well, I'll make a suggestion. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, this is Sandra. I, I don't think we should uh, change it um, by much if we change it at all. So do you have a suggestion? Right now we're at 99. Right. How do you feel about 98.5? I think I'd be okay with 98.5, but I don't know that I could go any lower than that based on the history. What about others? 88. Dave, uh, real quick, I, I don't have that memo in front of me and it's hard to toggle between the two. What was our low watermark back during the last recession from a collection perspective? I think it was 
98.29, if I remember right. <laughs> Uh, 98.1 in 2010. Uh, so, oh, sorry, low point. Huh, yeah, sorry, uh, 97.78 in 2007. Went up to 97.95% in 08, 98.27 in 09, and 98.1 in 2010. So I look at the, the Great Recession, we lost 8 million jobs. In the last month, we've lost like 30 million jobs. So I, I'm a proponent of, of ratcheting that number down quite a bit. What do you suggest? Something below our, our low watermark during the last recession because there's, I mean, another 20 some odd million people that have lost their jobs. So I'm not arguing that we shouldn't lower it, but I think there is a huge difference in the job loss numbers and the way this happened between the two different instances in that employers are incentivized by the government to offer these employees their jobs back. And if the employee refuses, then they're not eligible for unemployment. So I'm not sure that big number is going to stay that big. Probably won't. Um, that's all I wanted to clarify. I also have a level of concern that, you know, some of our larger counties are going to defer some of our tax payments, which, which could have a material impact on our incoming cash flow as well. So we need, Gavin, how about a number? So you said it was 97, 97, 97.78. So somewhere between 97 and 97 and a half percent. How about 97 and a quarter? That seems to be in the middle of those two numbers. Yes? I don't know, maybe I'm an optimist. I think that might be a little low. You also remember we, we, we've been we've been hit with some pretty good refunds as well, which, which come you know it, which has to be taken into account to that number as well. So it's not just true collections; it's collections minus refunds as well. Yeah, Gavin, thanks for pointing that out. The information Dave provided back 07, 8, 9, and ten, uh, especially in Cook County, you saw the asterisks on the information that included some major refund scenarios on a couple major pieces of property down along the I-90 corridor that impacted those numbers. Uh, the AT&T property, the Maritech property, to name just a couple. I just want to remind the board of that. And those were clawed back several years later after those were settled. So that, that if we would have looked at this in real time, it would have been a higher number. But then obviously when those refunds, you know, trailed back, that it did impact it. She noted that in the chart there that you see. Okay, do others want to indicate some a number where they might be comfortable? I kind of agree with Gavin. I'm usually an optimist, but um, 97 seems um, you know realistic. When you look at these numbers, it's it's also really surprising, not surprising, but you know a lot of our money comes from Cook County and Cook County was, the lower number on all these averages. Um, so. Cook County, just, Dave, can you explain how Cook County, how, how between Cook and Lake, the two work with the readjustments and. Yeah, that, well, I think that probably the, the critical thing is, um, it is really the relative dollar amount that we're collecting from the two. I mean, there, there is a, a, a timing issue that happens that causes some back-end adjustments, a lagging adjustment on, on the collections. But that, it, 
in terms of overall, overall dollar amount, that's it, it's not big and it gets trued up after we get through a, um, a, a year cycle. Uh, but we do uh, get um, the, you know, Blake and and Cook together um, make up 90-ish percent of our overall uh, collections and. Um, and of that, you know, Lake is, um, uh, Cook is larger than Lake, so it's probably between the two, uh, more like a 55-45-ish uh, kind of combo in terms of the relative percentage that they're bringing in, in terms of overall revenue. Um, you know, there is a, a timing on the collections, um, actually tends to, ten, tends to help uh, the district um, in that all the money doesn't come in on exactly the same day. Um, so, because we've got slightly different due dates with Cook as opposed to the uh, Collar counties, but that helps our cash flow a little bit. Um, but I think that you know, the, you know, from from a overall planning perspective, uh, fifty-five to sixty percent of our funds are coming in through Cook. The remainder through the Collar counties. Okay, so Leah, you mentioned 97, are you 97 or 97 and a quarter? I think I can be either. Others? Okay, well for now, um, well, I'll, I'll weigh in, I, I'm probably more at the at the not wanting to go below 98 percent um based on this information um can we ask for two models one that includes the 98.5 and one that includes the 97.25. It'll, it'll at least show us, you know, give us a place to start with both. Uh, I mean, at this time I'm probably between those two. So I guess if we have the upper and lower limits then we can figure out what's in the middle there because I'm probably in the middle of those two numbers, but that's fine. Would you be more comfortable at 98? 97.5, between 97.5 and 98 are just kind of my thought process. I don't think I want to go under 97.5, but that, that, like I say, if we want to do the two that you recommend, then we'll be able to at least see where we're, you know, how, how they vary and, and I, I think we're going to come right between those two. Okay, so that's 2021. Typically when we do this exercise, we then, you know, think about what we think CPI is going to be in the out years. Do we want to try to adjust those at this time as well? Because I'll, here's the other thing is my, I think what, what those of you who've been on the board a little while know is you, know, you, do, you do the work and you kind of, your best estimates are in the current year. And then as the out years come along, you know, you've put your, your guess is in there but you know there's outside factors or there's there's things that you know about you've got current contracts in place and then those contracts are expiring you don't know what those things are what the numbers will be for those and so the information gets less and less accurate the farther you go away from the current day and so um we will we will have a chance to true up the out years in January, you know, we'll work a year at a time. However, if we want to change these CPI assumptions to see where the trajectory of our line goes, we can't. I need feedback from you though. I, I would say, Penny, let's just focus on the current year. Um, there's so much uncertainty right now from a whole economic perspective that it's almost impossible for us to look out beyond 12 months. So I would say, for my opinion, let's focus on the current year. Okay. Is it? Does anyone disagree with that? That's fine. That's fine. Okay. That makes it easier. 
Okay, so um, the next large assumption would be new growth. Do we wanna leave new growth at 15 million or do we want to reduce that? <clears throat> well, I know new home construction was off to a great start this year and it's taken a big hit. So I'm not sure how much of that makes up our new growth numbers. If was some of it commercial too? Um, this is, I think, primarily residential. Yeah. Okay. So it typically, has been primarily residential, as we've seen over time. This is tear downs and rebuilds, things like that. We do have hey, some new properties. Hey Dave, I think on but I think even if you zero that number out, it's not a huge delta, is it? No. Right. But we, we know for sure we've got some new properties coming on, uh, and we just know they're near completion. One of them's the apartments there on uh, Huff Street. One of them is you know those that housing development over at the post office, just to name a couple that are pretty visible. I mean, those are coming on the books for sure. I mean, that's why we have felt that number's okay, but certainly it's up to the board, whatever they want to do. From a modeling perspective, Gavin, uh, you're right. Um, you know, if you change this assumption by a few million dollars in either direction, it does have an impact, but it is not a material impact. It will be completely lost with, you know, based on the kind of change that you're talking about in the tax collection rate. Uh, this will not be a material change. So what, what if we cut the number in half? Sounds reasonable. Okay. Okay. Um, the next items, teacher salaries, admin, the next, one, two, teacher salary, admin salary, classified salaries, medical insurance, um, those are all contract driven. And so we really can't make any changes into those, in those. We, in next year, we do not have anything allocated for the cost shift. Personally, I think that that's, a, that's okay. Does anyone disagree and wanna change that item? Okay. Um, we are assuming that we will um, still be using our debt service extension base. Um, is there any reason for us to reconsider that? No. Not today, but I will say my piece. And at some point I do want to look at that. Um, I totally agree. I was really excited to get rid of that. You know what? I think actually going through this exercise would be, will be good. It'll give us a little bit of a glimpse into um, what it might take to reduce $2 million. You know? Um, investment rate of return. Does anyone want to argue this might increase? No. That was a joke. That was a joke. That was a joke. Um, shall, shall, we, shall we leave it? Shall we reduce it? For members, I, I, would, I, I would hope that maybe you leave it at the same assumption that I modeled for you before because it's a real pain in the neck for me to try to change on the fly. So... Um, bringing it down significantly as I had done in the models I showed you. And then with those assumptions would make my life a lot easier for you tonight and be able to provide you the information that you're seeking. So will you remind me the percentage that you modeled for us? Yes. Give me just one moment. I think it's 1.75. I think. But Dave, or did you drop it lower? I dropped it lower. Right. Okay. Uh, give me one second. Well, while you work on that, um, let's move down to the Ed Fund, the revenue. We assumed 0% increases everywhere there except in the EBF proration. Um, I know that we have had some, you know, we had some information saying that, you know, because we're a tier four district, we may need to pay something back. Um, and that, that was, a, it could go from a small number to a larger number. Brian, what are you hearing about this? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the state legislature is going back in session tomorrow uh, down in Springfield. So we'll know a lot more 
probably two weeks from today uh, when they wrap up. Uh, you know, they have to have, by law, are, are expected to have a budget by the end of May, by June 1st. Um, not sure if they're going to hit that or not. Um, well, that will remain to be seen within the action they take here over the next several days. Um, I'll tell you what I'm hearing. You know, now this is just chatter coming out of caucus conversations because they have not been in session. That, um, and I'm hearing this from multiple sources in Springfield, that the, the state is, or the state legislature is considering the EBF funding to remain flat. Uh, meaning that they won't touch it, they won't increase it. Now, remember back in January, they said they were going to put an additional $350 million into the fund. I don't think that's going to happen. So I think it's going to stay flat. And truthfully, we weren't going to see any increase anyway. Uh, we had basically kept this at a flat, uh, basically flat, uh, maybe a few thousand dollars increase, but it wasn't going to be significant. Um, I, I would suggest leaving it flat for now. I've just not heard to the contrary. Um, at least that's what I'm hearing as far as education spending on the state budget. Okay. <clears throat> There's, I'm wondering how other board members feel about that. I mean, there's part of me that on this, I'd like to be optimistic. Um, this is an area where they have not, when it was just, um, before the EBF formula went in, it was just the state funding. And this is an area where they didn't short us in the past. Um, Great point, Penny. They rarely touch this, truthfully. They mess with the categorical grants more. Yeah. My temptation is to leave this as is from my perspective um, in hopes of having some more information. Yeah, I'm fine with leaving it. Okay. Seems like I'm getting thumbs up from people. Is there anyone who strongly disagrees and wants to argue differently or advocate differently? Okay. Penny, I can come back with some info on the interest earnings if, if you'd like. Yes. So I, I didn't model it strictly speaking as a, as a percentage, um, but I modeled it, well, actually I did, I guess a different kind of percentage. I took a look at um, what it would be relative to our current interest earnings budget. So it's really more reflective of, you can think of it as, as corresponding to what would happen with interest rates. Um, but I assume that we would, um, in next year, would have 50% of the interest earnings that we, that we were budgeting this year, that the year after it would be 25%. So basically going down by, by three quarters of where we were today. Um, and then over the next few years, coming back up by 25% each year, so that in the final year, we would be back at the same kind of interest assumption that we have now. So you could think of that as, as, as being similar to the interest rate that's here, um, that it would be going down um, by about half, reflecting that we would have some of our longer term investments um, that are rolling off and would be reinvested at much lower rates um, in 2022, um, presuming that interest rates are still depressed, um, that we would have most of our higher yielding uh, investments, um, we would have ridden those down and reinvested at a much lower rate. So we would be running at about 25% of the, of the current uh, rate and then starting to work its way back up in the years after. Okay, is everybody okay if we leave, let Dave leave this the way he modeled it? Just have one question, uh, Dave. What, you used the word material difference earlier. What, what kind of difference would a 1% higher investment rate of return make on our investments? Mike, I, I would have to, it would take me a little bit of time. I'd have to pull that that up and um, yeah, I'd be able to do that a little later to, to take a look at it. Um, and um, although there are no 1% higher rate options that are available for us, um, but I can give you an idea about a, what a 1% swing is. Well, there might not be options in the current, you know, paradigm that you're looking at, but I know, and I'm, you know, 
would, if it would be material difference to double our rate of return, you know, there might be ways to do that when you look at professional money managers among the top in the country with longstanding reputations. I understand from my time on the finance committee that we have to be very conservative with what we invest in. Uh, but there may be other options that haven't been considered. Yeah, the, you know, we looked at an, act, at, at an actively managed portfolio um, recently in the finance committee um, and, and what that would do for us. Um, and, and we are constrained by our investment policy and the, uh, the finance committee and, and policy committee had some thoughts around that with an inclination to um, actually limit our investments um, to the kinds of things that we have been investing in um, recently. Um, so th there would be a fair bit of work to um, you know, analyze what's permissible under the law that a, um, a nationally ranked money manager you know, could invest in. Uh, but when we took a look at an actively managed portfolio, given the, the, the really more of the, the state guidelines of what is permissible for municipal investments, um, there was the opportunity for a slight increase, um, but uh, a good portion of that was consumed by additional fees for the active management. Um, and in the end, uh, there really wasn't, it, it wasn't worth it to even bring that to the full board uh, to advocate for it uh, because the incremental earnings um, really didn't, weren't worthwhile, you know, for the effort that was involved. When did you do that? Uh, that was, Gavin, what was that about? Uh, it was in the fall, wasn't it? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it was literally like somewhere between three and six months ago. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, in this new environment where we're looking at totally new uncertainty around revenue streams, um, it might be worth talking to a new and different possible investment manager who might have lower fees or other options. Mike, I, I, Mike, I can tell you their fees were exceptionally competitive. And unless we're willing to take equity risk, which we cannot do with our funds, um, there, there's not a huge opportunity here. We cannot do per our current policy, right? Or per the law. There's, there, there are legal restrictions um, that, that prevent certain kinds of investments. And anything outside of the norm, the board has to approve in a separate action. That's how our policy change uh, was enacted uh, just a few months ago. Mm -hmm. We looked at it, Mike, and it just was a small amount of possible money and it wasn't worth more risk and much more management and changing a lot of the way that we've done things that seem to be working well for a small amount of return. Well, I guess we could always revisit this, right? Anytime. Yep. Okay, so we'll we'll let Dave's model stand the way it is. We won't. We know it's not one point seven five, but it's his own <laughs> concoction. Best guess. <laughs> there you go. Um, okay, so then the next category is expenditures within the Ed Fund and we had included in our original assumptions a 2% increase in all of these items, purchase services, supplies, and capital outlay. And these are some of the categories that um, in Brian's weekly update, he provided us some numbers on. So if we were to zero out these numbers, it will um, deduct about $177,000 from the budget. Mm. So um, I believe it's more than that, Penny. That was just in one category, if I'm not mistaken. Well, this is in the Ed Fund. You've got more in O&M. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, so right. we know what that means. Are we comfortable? I mean, do we want to make these changes? I see two nodding heads. Yeah. Three. I need more response. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard for me to read you guys when you're on there. Okay, so we will zero out um, 
the expenditures, purchase services, supplies, and capital outlay. We have $2 million in instructional technology. Now, I mean, we have, we have a um, well-established plan of technology renewal in our district. And that's why we've had this line item you'll see holding in there constantly. Um, I, I wouldn't even begin to understand what would happen if we were to adjust this number. But I mean, we have contracts in place right now that I think if we were to adjust this number would be pretty disrupted. That is correct. I think if anything, Benny is probably gonna have to go up a little bit, no? Oh, I don't know. I, this is just. I guess I've not heard that from anyone yet. No, this is primarily just to support the Wonder World program, which can play, basically is a lot of our device leases as well as our software components. So it, it's been a number that's been adequate for us and been able to manage accordingly. But the software with Zoom and some of the potential stuff we have coming into the fall, isn't that going to come into this, this kind of accounting area? Matt, I'll let you jump in on that. Do you feel any concerns there? Matt, are you able to jump on? He's getting it. One second. Oh, there he is. I think if we just kept it, it should be okay. Zoom is just one of, of many software subscriptions that we have in the district. And we can certainly, we always look at all of our subscriptions every year and we don't renew ones that we're not using. So I think if we just held that number, I think we'd be pretty safe. And for... Uh, for our current year and for next year, we have the ability to use CARES Act proceeds mm -hmm. uh, to fund the purchase of a Zoom subscription. Good point. I, I'm just saying in general, I think, you know, with, with some of this remote learning, I think there might be other tools that we might utilize. And I just want to be cognizant as we're budgeting. Mm -hmm. so, so from the administration, is $2 million the right number? Yes, we believe it'd be appropriate. Okay. Is everybody comfortable? I was going to suggest, Penny, that if we leave it just the way that it is, and then we do ask them to come back with something, then it's administration. It's yeah. we we wouldn't be making the decision for them. Let them come back to us. Thank you, Sandra. Thank yeah, you for right. that. Thank you for that reminder. I okay. may change my mind in a couple of weeks. We'll see. <laughs> right. Let's get through this. Then moving on, we're in the O&M. Um, in the expenditures, we have purchase services and supplies. And according to um, Brian's write-up, zeroing those two out yields about $136,000. So do we want to go in that direction? Can you get thumbs Okay, I see a majority of thumbs there. Okay, summer projects. So um, I went back and looked. We approved two, $2,601,847 in summer projects. Um, would, would it be okay if we lowered the three million to 2.7 million? Why don't we lower it to two? Am I am I misremembering? I felt like when I joined the board, it was around two. No, but we've already approved the projects being paid for out of oh, this. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about next year. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. That's It's kind of <laughs> goofy how it legs. So I was thinking if we could, I mean, if we had some money in there in case something happens and there needs to be a change of some kind. Um, How do we feel? Is there any, I'll ask um, Dave and Brian, is there any reason why we wouldn't, why you wouldn't advise doing that? I'm fine with 2.7. It's what the number is. It won't exceed that. There, there also were several projects that uh, Brian shared information with the board about that uh, for this next summer were, were three projects. So the question had been posed, is there anything we could do to um, to get out of some of the current projects that we have underway. 
Um, there are, were several flooring projects that it would be possible to do so if the board wanted. Uh, we provided some information on that. Um, so that is the possibility to change that number as well, although we'd recommend that we do complete those projects. We would lose money at this point that we could not get back if we did. So one other point on this came up at the facilities committee meeting. We, I didn't report, but we decided not to move forward with planning two years out. We had, we had made that change. And then due to the crisis here, we're not gonna do that for next year. Hey, so, Brian, can you help me understand real quickly when you said we're going to lose money? Um, how are we going to lose money on the, uh, the, the summer projects we haven't uh, completed yet? If we were to cancel them at this point. The yeah, other three that were highlighted. Yeah. Right. I mean, was there a cancellation fee? You, Dave, I know you checked into that. Right. Yeah. So, so pro projects that, that we have already contracted, uh, you know, we have product that is on order, that if we cancel the order, we'll be paying for it. Um, in other cases, we've got a product that is already here or we have work in progress. Um, so it makes it very difficult to get out of, of doing those. We do have three, however, uh, where uh, we've placed the order, but the factory has not begun production of the material. So we do have the ability to cancel three without affecting anything else and, and being able to unwind those three projects um, if the board wanted to move in that direction. Um, the, uh, we've been advised that uh, we have until the end of this week because they anticipate beginning production um, on our orders at that point, in which case, if we cancel those orders, uh, then we are stuck paying for the product. And what were those three, uh, those three projects and the total uh, dollar amount, Dave? It is uh, the Countryside Library and Music Room Flooring, which is about $35,000. Uh, the Grove Gym Floor, uh, which has actually got some rippling um, in there, uh, that was about $70,000. Uh, and um, uh, the North Barrington, actually it's North Barrington that's got the, the rippling, Grove just needs to be done as well. A North Barrington Gym Floor, which is 77. Um, so that's um, 100 and, uh, 40, about 100 and, uh, with um, a budgeted cost of actually 182, um, but yeah, 182, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to look at those numbers and get them out all at the same time. So. I, I have the memo right here. It's 181,935, yeah. but in your memo, you said that the, the decision had to be made by Friday, May 15th. So I'm just checking. Yeah, we... We, uh, if you if you make the decision tonight, I think we're we're okay based on information that I got um, uh, yesterday late afternoon from Nicole. Okay, and then typically we do the A and E before the materials are ordered. Wouldn't we still need to pay for the A and E? That's correct. Uh, the A and E cost we would, um, which is a smaller portion of this, and uh, you know the balance we would be able to save. Uh, and the A and E costs would not be wasted in that. Uh, you know, I mean, these are projects that need to be done, um, and I recommend to the board that we continue these projects as scheduled. Um, and uh, if we don't, however, uh, when we are able to do them, we would um, simply we wouldn't re re incur new A and E costs for these projects. So when I added up the A and E, it's roughly fifteen thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Reaction from the board? I, I think we should continue with these projects. I think, you know, especially North Barrington, it's a safety issue if you have rippling floors. Um, and when we look at the overall budget, yes, we want to save, you know, nickel and diming, but I, I think we're, we're being short-sighted if we want to stop these projects at this point. This is this is more need than want at this at this stage. So I think we need to we, we need to get our needs done and you know and, and do it right. So the safety is a significant point always, but on the other two projects, just what's worst case if we went one more year without changing those floors? I mean, could they would they work for one more year? That's really the question for me. 
Uh, I don't have Nicole on the um, on our call uh, at the moment to um, get into more of the details on the flooring. You know, could they last? Um, sure, if the board uh, chose to not do these projects. Uh, the challenge is that the you know that these are things that that should be done. You know, we've got um, uh, end of life uh, flooring. You know, in these places, you know, as the facilities committee vetted out these projects early on, you know, we we took a look at projects that we thought really needed to be done at this point in time. Um, so I think, as Barry said, you know, these are are projects that are needs in terms of maintenance for our facilities. Um, I'm anticipating that you know pressure on the uh, the O and M budget is likely to be greater um, in the coming years. So my one of my concerns is that if we don't complete these projects, it may be not one year, but two, three, four years, um, and and we've got failing flooring that we're attempting to repair um, or or maintain in a safe way for our students and staff. Well, I, I understand. However, um, I don't know if these physical areas fall under the referendum work in any way, shape, or form, but maybe they could. And we have just received almost $150 million to spend on this kind of thing. So I'm not that worried about <clears throat> improvements over the next Mike, few years. Mike, we cannot spend referendum dollars on these items. We can only spend the referendum money on what we said we were going to spend it on. Right. And I, I know our description was a little bit general in certain terms for certain buildings. So that's what I meant when I said I don't know if these could fall under that. But I do think we need to keep in mind um, that we have that money to spend on the facilities improvements and um, changes that we did say we we're going to spend it on. And there was a little room there, but um, I think if we can go another year on these two floors that don't pose any safety consideration that we should do that at this time with all this uncertainty. Others? I, I, I tend to agree if it's not a safety issue, which again, I haven't been up to North Barrington, so I can't quantify if that is a safety issue. I just have to trust our, our staff here. But um, if, if we can defer some of our maintenance, um, I'm, I'm in the, the mode of deferring our maintenance if possible. I will just mention, I am getting a, a text from uh, uh, Dr. Korb at Countryside, who's very familiar with the flooring condition there. He's noted that uh, there is a rip in the middle of the floor in the countryside library flooring, um, which can be a safety issue. And he's got um, you know, the, the flooring um, in the music area. Um, there's some challenges with cleaning there um, to be able to clean it properly based on the condition of the flooring as well. Yeah, I would, I would tend to... Sorry, Dr. Corb. I would tend to, to defer as well if it's not a safety issue. Um, you know, I mean, I, I, and, and with the gyms, I, I would want to know what's going on, you know, with the other gym that doesn't have the rip lane. But, you know, we've all seen basketball games that have gone awry in these elementary schools, and you don't want to, you know, have that attributed to some sort of issue with the flooring. Um, is the is the fence still a go? There's no way to pull back from the fence. Dang it. <laughs> um, is, there, is there a way to, you know, I know they're called summer projects, but a way to put it off and possibly do it over winter break, depending on what's happening then in the world? Or what if we don't go back to school in the fall? Well, we would we would definitely have to rebid things. Yeah, the bids are only good for so long, and then we—I mean, if we cut it from the budget, we cut it from the budget. That's what we're talking right. about. So, so I'm going to throw something out. Um, I know we care about safety and security for sure. Um, given the timeline. Um, I mean, do, does the board want to make this decision here tonight? Or would we like to ask the administration to go back, do their due diligence, and make, make a decision on our behalf? Because the decision needs to be made by Friday. Um, well, does it need to be made by Friday or tonight? 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got Friday confused. We need direction because we have to make this change by Friday if we're going to do it on these right. three projects. Yeah, we're 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 at, at the risk that they're uh, they're they're starting uh, production, but I think we've got a day or two here um, yet, based on um, uh, from what Nicole described to me, a little longer startup at on their mill. So, yes, so, so we've got a couple days, but we we don't have much time here. So would would the board and you can disagree with me? Would the board feel comfortable? asking the administration to go back and really look at these three projects and if there if there are safety reasons why they need to be done to move ahead and do them and if not hold back i don't know i think that i think they want i mean do you have time to do that i just got a text message from uh katie matthews the principal of grove principals are watching tonight i asked them to watch because they're they're very concerned about I'm, this. I'm moment. glad they are because we're getting the feedback we need. Right? They yeah. are immediate um, answers. The floor in the gym at Grove is separating. She said in several places they've been piecemealing it and put cones up, uh, waiting on this repair. There, that's what she said. All right. I, I could also make the argument at Huff though. I mean, the kids are flying all over the place. So I mean, it, it, I really want to know if it's really a safety issue or if it's a want. And I, I don't mean to be rude about it, but I mean, we're talking a couple hundred grand here. None of these are wants. I want to make it clear. I mean, none of these summer projects are wants. We vetted that stuff out. Um, there's, you're right. We got tough decisions to make. I agree with that. I mean, and, you know, we've got a, you know, budget that's going to have some challenges here. Um, none of these projects came forward as wants. They're all needs. Well, I, and I guess well, I would say, I remember, um, you know, our conversation with, with the Huff PTO and they felt that theirs was really a need too, but yet the administration prioritized these ahead of theirs. And I know there were a lot of Huff parents that really felt like that was a need and we should have been addressing that too, but you're telling us that these are even worse than that. That's why we put these as a priority. I mean, just have some context there. Penny, we're still trying to get to a point where we, we would discuss, uh, um, let Dave go and run the model, right? Yeah. So we're, we're going to, after he does that, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about this some more. Yes. Right. So we need, I, I, like, go ahead. I, I, I liked your suggestion on, um, you know, let's let them make the decision if it's a need for safety reasons, then we do it. If not, then um, let that be part of what they come back with perhaps. So for ne for right now, um, can we leave two points? We can even do 2.6 in here because there are contingencies built in to each one of these projects. And then let Dave go run the numbers, come back to us in real time here, hopefully before 10 o'clock, we can get there. Um, is that okay with everyone? Yeah. I'm okay. okay. This is much bigger than $180,000. Right. right. Okay. So 2.6, not 2.7. Okay. And then we have the transportation fund. Um, we have a contract that has a 2% increase built into it. Supplies. Do we have any flexibility in supplies? Our administrators? I think we do. Dave, you can chime in here. That supplies in the transportation is fuel. So that's what the that's what this is, the, the lion's share of this. Do we have a negotiated rate on fuel that we know of? We do. We're in part of a co-op to purchase fuel. Is the two percent the right number or do I'm looking to you for direction on this number? Dave, I, I mean, I have to admit to you, I've, over the last month, when I go to the pump, it has been swinging like crazy. It's hard for, I, I don't know anybody else. I noticed it just yesterday. It was back up yesterday. You know, it was real low two and a half weeks ago. Now, yesterday it was back up. So I, I don't know, Dave, any thought on this? No, it's a, it's a tough one. I, you know, I mean, my, my gut says that, that we're probably okay if we um, lower that. Uh, from 2% simply because there's been 
uh, negative pressure because everything's shut down and people aren't buying fuel. Uh, oil prices um, are, are quite low. Uh, how is that going to play out over the next year? I'm not sure. Um, so but instead, of, instead of zeroing it out, what if we just lowered it to, to one and a quarter? I, that was just a number throw out there. I'd be fine with one. I mean, I'm just guessing here. Yeah, How do others feel? Do one percent. Okay. Is anyone does our co-op, Dave? Does our co-op uh, look to hedge uh, our fuel costs for any extended period of time, based on our historic volume? I I don't believe so, but I have to look into into that. I think they have storage issues there. Mm -hmm. I don't think they do. I think they bid it and then they rebid it. That's what I believe happens. I don't think you need to take delivery of it, but um, it, it might be something to look at. Okay, so I, Dave, do you need me to walk through these again real quick or have you been keeping notes? I've been keeping notes, I think I'm good. Okay, we're gonna let you um, leave the meeting for a few minutes if you'd like, and we're gonna move on to another topic. Um, Although if you if you're moving on to the uh, food service uh, presentation, I'm going to at least stick around for the. I want to be around for the beginning and end of that. Although Leanne will join us uh, for that. If you go on to something different, I'll step out while I'm. Uh, well, let's, let's do food service right away then. Okay. Then you can just go. Um, okay. Um, well, I guess I should ask the board: Is there anything else on this before we let Dave go? Okay, then let's move on to the BHS food service update, which was a pleasant surprise. Um, it was, and we have a uh, uh, presentation here. I believe either Dave or Leanne's going to share the screen here. Correct, one of you. Hi. Yeah, Leanne, Leanne I'll, I'll share the screen, and uh, I think what I'd what I'd like to do is just uh, you know a quick um, introduction on this topic. Uh, you know, board members, when we're having the conversations around food service, if, if you, you really have to think back um, a couple of years, uh, Leanne has been uh, working on this before I joined the district uh, almost two years ago. Um, and last year, um, you agreed to take the high school off program, off the national school lunch program, uh, with a goal of providing the right kind of, of fuel for learning. And uh, Leanne did a, a presentation to you that it talked about some of the decisions that you had made around um, uh, providing the right kind of time for learning and the right kinds of uh, tools for learning. And, and then we talked about providing the right kind of fuel for learning. And um, in doing this, um, it, it was a very significant change in the kind of program and uh, it had some investment requirements on behalf of the, the district and that we're giving up national school lunch program revenue. Um, but the participation rate was um, uh, quite frankly, just ridiculously low, uh, even among those students who are eligible for free meals over at the high school. Um, and uh, what we've done, just to give you um, a little hint of what's to come, uh, we operated this program about three quarters of the year. Uh, and during that time, uh, we exceeded the annual, um, our annual goal. So the numbers that we showed you a little bit over a year ago as to what we were projecting, we exceeded those only having had this program in place for about three quarters of the year. Um, and at the end of the presentation, uh, Leanne will show you some numbers about um, and talk a little bit about where we expect we would have been um, had we had a full year of service. And uh, it, it probably would have been about double what we did last year. So really an amazing success. And, but with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Leanne um, and start to talk through uh, what we've done and where we are. Thank you, Dave. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Sound great. Okay. Um, so tonight's uh, although we have the K-12 program, tonight's uh, 
really a celebration of our BHS food service and the off program experience. As Dave said, there's multiple years of research and parent input that went into taking the program. And of course your, your, um, your vote and your blessing to move forward with taking the program off uh, last uh, spring. So what I want to do tonight is go over the year in review with you, talk a little, remind you a little bit about the implementation timeline, what the student experience has been so far, um, a little bit about the student input on their food committee and what the menu looks like, and, and then a financial recap at the end. So this was the implementation timeline. This is what we, we came to you in April. We approved it. May right away Quest got to work at working with our students. Um, even before the contract was approved, we took students to a couple of sites that had Quest as their vendor. And then in May, we had a food service, um, a food committee, excuse me, that they facilitated. In July, um, Quest started to service um, our students during our summer programs and summer school at the high school. And then on August 20th was our very first day of meal service. Um, the, the coffee bar, um, and we really need to find a name. I know Steve and our director, Lauren Delahoy, are looking for a name because really coffee is not the, uh, the top seller at that location. It's some of our, our snacks and our, our boxes of um, hummus and different sandwiches and our smoothies and our milkshakes are really our top seller. So we are, um, they were in the middle of uh, renaming that, that portion of our, of our serving station uh, when, when this COVID thing happened. So they're looking to rename it because it's much more than a coffee bar. And then March 13th, just as a reminder, that was the last day that Quest served foods, food to our students. So the pictures on the left were in my presentation last year, and the pictures on the right are what our kids get now. And I am extremely proud of um, the salad bar that's put out, the uh, yogurt bar that you see at the bottom, and the fresh fruits, everything's fresh. All the salads that you see made at the top are made. Um, they don't bring anything in. They're all made uh, fresh on a daily basis by our teams, um, our food service team. So very different um, salad bar and fruit bar that our kids had uh, from over a year ago. Also, um, some of this, uh, some of these pictures were taken during the prep time. The picture on the right, um, something so you understand the level of training that Quest put their employees through. They, uh, I know that I took that picture last summer. I remember taking it. They were, they were learning dicing skills and chopping skills. And some of our current food service workers at Barrington High School that had really been heating and serving, they took about two weeks of time and did different trainings and got them preparing different stations. And then they allowed our staff to come down and sample the food um, that they had prepared. So that was a, you know, just they took time to make sure that our, our success, our experience was going to be successful by preparing uh, their staff. This was the food committee that I talked about. And this, there was uh, two or three of these uh, throughout the year. Um, one, actually one to start last May that they, we, uh, I worked with Heath McFall and Steve McWilliams and Nina uh, Erdrizi to identify students to meet with our Quest team and to talk about um, what they liked, um, what would they pay, what should the portion sizes be? And they filled out surveys. You can see on the bottom right, the students, um, I think the young lady taking a bite out of a sandwich. I wanna say that that was a, a portobello sandwich um, that was a vegetarian option. And uh, they're all taking notes on price points and, and different things and giving feedback. Um, so that was a great way to start uh, and they, I know they had some successful meetings this year that the Quest team took back and, and changed some things based on their feedback. Um, one of those things was I think they implemented a mac and cheese bar and a wing bar, which are two great big, um, great big uh, hits for our high school students. This is the uh, coffee bar uh, opening that I mentioned in September of last year. That brings in on average about $2,000 a day of revenue and the total sales since September 30th is $106,000. Um, just a little fun fact about our coffee bar, smoothies and milkshakes have combined for over $50,000 in sales. So that's that's pretty interesting. Half, half of the, the money coming out of there are smoothies and milkshakes. 
So now I wanna talk about our options for our students um, called the Bronco Meal. <clears throat> and one of the things that makes our program um, ideal, special, unique, um, our, our parents on the committee, as well as myself, as well as the Barrington High School administration, uh, we had visited a couple of schools that had like this line with the hot lunch line and the, and the free and reduced kids could have an option on the hot lunch line only. We have something at almost every station that has this Barrington Bracco meal logo on there's displays in the um, there's displays in the uh, cafeteria at each station and the kids can easily identify what's the Bronco meal by these little icons. And when they are doing that, um, they're making those choices. These, it's anybody making this choice because they can get a nice meal for 350 and they can get, you know, um, an option with an entree or a whole fruit or a milk for 350. And so they're making these choices. These are the choices of all the stations. And then they have um, these choices. Uh, there's a menu similar to if you have an elementary student, right? You get a menu for the month. Um, they have a monthly menu posted on the website. You could check it out sometime or look at the past menus that were available. So the kids could get, you know, on any given day, one of these three options or one of those options. What I want you to note is how many meals we served kids more than what is in the past. The kids are choosing the entire meal. The kids are choosing those Quest meals. And what I mean by the Quest meals are the options you see here or on the previous slide, one of these, one of these full Bronco meal options. And you know, it would have been about two and a half or about two and a quarter times what we served last year if our school year would have com completed itself. So we're pretty excited about the kids choosing that, af that affordable yet nice rounded meal for them. Um, on a daily basis. So that, that was a pretty big success. Uh, that was one of my, um, I wanna say pet peeves is like Dave said at the beginning that we have these options, we have these lunches for kids and they're not taking advantage of it. They're not even, they're, they're quali qualifying for free and reduced lunch but they're not um, taking advantage of it. Just to be clear about the data, the 64,000 that's mentioned here in the 101, this is all of the meals. It's whether a kid was on free lunch, reduced lunch, or it was a paid lunch. These are these are the number of lunches served, complete lunches, and it didn't re, uh, regardless of payment status. Um, here's some more consumption facts. Um, when we went into this with Quest, I remember they still, you know, I was I was. Some of you might remember, you know, how I was like, oh my gosh, we served so many bags of chips and we served so much pizza. Let's have the kids, you know, what what else can they buy? And Quest was like, well, Leanne, we're gonna put good food out there for your for your kids but they're still gonna buy the pizza. They're still gonna buy the chips and boy, Quest was right. So, um, you know, pizza is still our, our hot seller. Um, the breakfast is definitely improved. We're serving a lot more breakfast than we have in the past. Um, so those are just some of the, the popular items that I thought might be, you might be interested in seeing what we, what we serve this year. Um, we, this was the assumption for the revenue that we came up with. We expected there to be 174 days. When Quest won the bid, they said that they would share what they call as a rent check of 75% return to the district. Remember when kids put uh, money on their Quest account, it goes directly to Quest bank account. And then on a monthly basis, we get that 7.5% return based on the monthly sales. So, so far this year, and actually we won't get any more because they're not serving any meals right now, but this year our revenue has been $78,000. I'm sorry, that was projected. This year our revenue has been $90,000 because our actual revenue was 1.2 million. So we exceeded that by about 150% with only, you know, a, a rough estimate, but very close to 75% of the school year completed. So 130 days completed, 1.2 million, we exceeded our revenue. Um, this is um, wh where the chart uh, looks for all the years past. Um, I had really worked, you know, F FY19 or the school year before Quest took over, you know, I had seen that, that dipping for 16, 17, and 18. So I really put some pressure on Chartwells to improve the experience as much as they could in 19. Um, so it did go up a little bit in 19. 
Uh, you never saw the final number in 19 because I'd made this presentation in April of last year or March. Um, but so yes, you know, we did rise up a little in sales due to the pressure from, from administration and trying to improve that program. But basically overall, um, you know, we're, we're over $400,000 or $350,000 um, more than last year with only 7%, 75% of the attendance. So if you would take that and assume the full school year um, would have been completed, our sales would have been projected to exceed uh, what we did last year by about 154%. So we're really proud. Um, Quest has been an outstanding partner. Um, Janine Stark had shared with me yesterday or the day before how one of the things that made her smile in the seniors video um, at Barrington High School this year was several mentions of the food service uh, being so much improved. And, um, you know, that's, that's just, it's just a win. The kids were very happy with what they have available to eat. I see a lot of them making some healthy choices. Like I said, some are still buying the chips, ordering the milkshakes. But overall, you're putting some really nice food in front of them. And um, the after school piece has always been a wish of Steve's. And um, it's really taken off that coffee bar slash stack, slack, slash stack station, excuse me, is open until about, uh, if Steve's still on, I'm not sure, but I think it's 4 or 4.30, it's open until. And those kids use that, they buy it, they run out of sandwiches, snacks, different fuel, fuel for the kids after school. So if we would have run a full year, um, this is what we would have would have we would have done based on daily averages, and we just couldn't be um, more happy with our experience with Quest. Um, so at this time, do you have any questions? Questions from the board. All I'll say, Leanne, is I know you I know you put a ton of work into this. So uh, awesome job. Thank you. The parents, uh, we had a food service committee, I'm sorry, a parent menu planning advisory meeting about two weeks ago um, so that they could interact with my replacement, Sarah, and so that momentum can keep um, going. And Sarah's met that, that committee and those parents are still very active and you know, want to continue improving our food service program overall. So it, this, this will continue to be a priority in the district. Thank you I so have, much to everybody who's been involved. It's a big job. It's really awesome. I have a neighbor who is in eighth grade, and she told me one of the things she was looking forward to at the high school was better food. <laughs> I know. And, you know, Lauren had all kinds of ideas, Lauren, the food uh, quest to go to like the Bronco time at the middle schools and talk about the food service. And, you know, and I think we still need to do something just so parents have some information on what that food service looks like. Um, uh, we'll do that. But, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were even going to try to get the kids more excited about it. But I know the word's out there. The word is out there. So. Well, thank you very much for everything. And this has been Good. a pleasant surprise. <laughs> yes, I figured this would be a pretty uh, easy presentation to give because it's all good news. And in the middle of everything else going on, we need some good news. So yeah, huge yeah. thumbs up from, uh, from uh, most high schoolers I talked to. My daughter asked me the other day, because of course, God forbid she get up and make her own lunch. She was like, could you make me something like we have at the high school? I'm like. Yeah. Bring it yourself. Yeah. Wow. I've never heard that before, Angela. That's good. All right. That's a testament to what we're doing. Yeah. We're really proud of it. And Lauren even has more ideas moving forward. And just um, as I hang, as I, as I tune off here, uh, just to say thank you to Quest 2 for their partnership at, they're coordinating a lot of our donated meals uh, with Barrington Children's Charities and Giving Day. And they're working um, to help with all of that right now. So they've just been a great partner and we have some wonderful organizations that continue to feed our kids right now. And, and that's the important thing. So, all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Have thank a good you. night, everybody. Okay. Um, we have one more discussion item, but I just want to make sure all of us are on here. Okay. Um, we need to circle back to an action item though. Mike, um, when you lost service there for a while, um, I didn't realize you had lost. And so we had a tie vote on the Sodexo um, renewal action item. And so 
since all seven of us are present, I'd like to um, retake that vote. So is there a motion? Can I ask a question or maybe it's, this is after the motion. Um, what happens if we don't pass Sodexo? What is, I, I, I guess I missed something here. What, what is the next step on the, um, if, if, we, if, if this motion doesn't pass, then, then what happens in the fall? If we do not pass this renewal, it's a great question, Barry, then one of two things, I'll, I'll ask the board for direction, okay? Uh, we have two options. One, we could go back and ask them to change their proposal based on the reduction in service and, and reduction in food selection and some of the things that were recommended to us, or were not recommended, but were provided as options. Um, you know, then Sodexo also will have the option whether or not they want to give us notice to continue or in that fashion or not. If that is the case, then we would have to rebid in a very short order uh, here in mid-May. So we've got some significant challenges, um, you know, if we don't. So that's, I'll ask the board for direction if, if this is not approved. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the Sodexo contract renewal? This is Sandra. I think I moved before. I'll, I'll motion again. We need a second, please. I'll second. Yeah, sure. I can second. Oh, okay. That's fine. Okay. Um, any discussion before we roll call? If yes, we... we if we vote no and um, if we go out to bid um, under normal circumstance, when would you need to have a new deal in place by? Would have already wanted it in place at this point because it's a, a July first uh, switchover. Um, it takes a little time for a new vendor to come in. Um, so, I mean, either we would end up with Sodexo at, at a different price or we would end up with a different vendor. Um, if it's a different vendor, then there's definitely some time to get things set up and ready to go for fall service. Uh, there's also a requirement for food service bids uh, to get funneled through ISBE. Uh, so they want to approve the bids. They want, they want to review the bid, uh, proposed bid award before the Board of Education considers it. Um, so there's also some process that's involved uh, that takes a little while to actually get done through ISBE. And I'm just looking at the attachment we received at our last meeting. And, you know, because I believe the, um, the finance committee had asked the administration to go back and talk to Sodexo about, you know, what if we didn't approve their 3%, how might we change our level of, the level of service here in order to offset that? And, you know, they furnished us with a number of options. You know, it says menus will be slightly limited or significantly limited. Current menus allow for three hot options and one cold. It's anticipated that one cold option would continue, but hot options would be reduced. Um, there was a reference to vegetarian options. Um, Offerings made at middle school would be reduced, eliminating most a la carte item, items. And then Sodexo's ability to support special programs such as Tasty Tuesdays could be eliminated. It says all of the above options would be decreased participation and revenue. Therefore, state and federal meal reimbursements would also suffer. So I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, share with, remind the board what some other options that we, you know, Sodexo laid out for us and if we weren't renewing at the at the three percent so any other questions okay roll call please Mike Shackleton no Angela Wilcox no Barry Altshuler yes Sandra Bradford? No. Penny Casimir? Yes. Gavin Newman? No. Leah Collister Lazari? Yes. Okay, I lost count there. 
You have three yes, four no. Three, yeah, four, four, okay. four no's, three okay. yes. Motion does not pass. So we need to give um, direction to Dr. Harris. How would you like to proceed? I think we should talk to them and try to get as much as close as we can to what we had for either the same price or maybe a smaller increase. Try that. And um, maybe go out to bed too. I mean, others. Yeah, I, I know that you already went back to you know the vendor and spoke with them. And Brian, I'm sure this is frustrating, and I'm sorry. You know, I, I said at the last meeting that I, I didn't like what they came back with, so you know, no surprise. But um, you know, I think that you know there's a difference between hey, the board really wants us to chat about this, and hearing the board's rejected your your offer. So you know, let's talk about what the other options are. You know, I felt like the response was kind of a hodgepodge of threats, but I didn't see anything like super concrete as far as what exactly was going to happen. So I think that it's, it should open up a conversation. And if we aren't happy with it, then let's get out to bid. I mean, I've got to believe people are looking for business right now. Others? At this time, Angela, um, most food service vendors are are locked in um, or they've they've bid out and, and the bids are being awarded um, you know right typically in May a, a June award is is fairly late so many of them already lined up with their book of businesses and and their plans for the next year um, I'm sure we would get bids if we went out um, I cannot guarantee that we would have um, you know, as we, we would work through the process as quickly as we could um, with uh, with ISBE. I don't know exactly what that timing would look like. We might be considering a bid award in August. I don't know um, how that would play out and, and how that might affect service when we would start back. Um, if we go back to Sodexo, I have no problem going back to them and, and getting you know the, the specifics. I, I think that if I had a better idea of what is the number that we're looking for? Um, if I told them, I, you know, I need a 0% renewal or a one or a two or, you know, two and a half, whatever it is, they'll be able to come back and say, well, here's exactly what that means in terms of a service reduction from what you're currently getting. Um, so that would be helpful if the board wants us to have that conversation. Um, if you, um, it, it's not an insignificant effort to go out for bid. Um, if you do want me to go out for bid, uh, we will begin to pursue that. Um, uh, that is, as I said, it's, it's not an insignificant process to get done. So the sooner I know that, the better. So is there a, a number um, where board members would be comfortable in a renewal? You know, so the 3% was what we were presented with this evening. I'm just wondering if there's another number Can I ask one quick question? Uh, Dave, when did they give us the 3% renewal? What date? I don't know, Mike. I'd have to go back and, and take a look at um, I mean, Was it a month, when, two months ago? Uh, it was, it was you know, we considered it the last uh, finance committee meeting, so it was in advance of that. So that but was I would at least. Go back and find out the date from Leanne as to when they, you know, when we actually got a confirmation of 3%. And it is tied in our contract against the um, uh, food away from home uh, consumer price in index. So there, there wasn't a ton of surprise in terms of what their ask was. Can you explain that? The, um, you know, it's, it's typical for food service contracts to have increases that are maxed out at, um, at, at some metric. In this case, it is the consumer price index but specifically the food away from home uh, um, section of the consumer price index, which is a standard part of the language available through the uh, ISB form for food service bids. So uh, that, that sets the, the upper end, of course, um, amounts lower than that certainly are always welcome. And um, you know, the business office is always, um, always pursues options below that. You know, Sodexo did indicate that uh, you know they also are faced with um, 
uh, pricing pressure related to uh, the uh, minimum wage law, uh, which has an increase on July 1st, um, and then another increase in January. Um, so you know, that with, and, and if you take a look at some of the current movement on CPI, uh, CPI for food has actually been up, even though other parts of uh, the economy uh, inflation have been down. Uh, so they're also taking a look at increases on food supplies uh, that affect next year's business. So I think that, is, that has been part of what they were contemplating in their renewal request. So um, yeah, I hope that's helpful in terms of background. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the clock and we still have more things to talk about here. So um, what if we ask, send this back to the finance committee and ask the finance committee to work with the administration on noodling this out a little bit on behalf of the board? Unless there's you know, a couple people that would like to volunteer to do that. Otherwise we need to give, we need to agree on direction to give to the administration tonight. Well, it sounds like time is an issue, potentially. I don't know when the finance committee meets again. I don't know, it might force a, a um, quicker conversation than it's already planned. We just need to give them some direction. And I'm not hearing a lot of, um, ideas right now. I know we're trying to react quickly. Well, maybe, yeah, can look at what we get from Sodexo without an increase. And is that, does that meet our needs? I mean, that's one easy option. And if it doesn't, then we, what increase do we need to have to meet the needs? If I remember correctly, their increase partially was because the minimum wage was going to go up. And so they were kind of holding firm on that, I think, um, was part of it. So I, I don't think they'll I don't think they'll be happy with zero. From what I remember Dave saying, right, that if we come with a number in the middle, there might be some flexibility and then they would cut their services. Yeah, I remember, I can't find this memo anywhere, but um, I remember that part of the, you know, it was, it was you know, milk is going to be more expensive, eggs are going to be more expensive, yada, yada. And then um, the minimum wage increase, which I was totally on board with that. But then it was, um, you know, there are some unknowns. We may have to have more staff. We may have to do some other things to facilitate the delivery of food. And I felt like the discussion was not very productive as far as that, you know, when, you know, Brian and David gone back and said, Hey, what can you do? That's why I said at the last meeting, I'm kind of disappointed in the response. Like, yeah, we're all working harder. I mean, it just seemed like a, a big ask. So, you know, and, and they didn't change the ask. The ask was what it was. They went back and they said, Nope, we're staying firm. So, well, you know what though they did. Okay. So the memo is attached to the budget item from our meeting last Tuesday. That's where you can find it. Thanks, Penny. I mean, they did come back with some changes that we could expect if we didn't approve the 3%. So what if I suggest, I'll throw this out there. What if we ask the administration to go back and give us a glimpse into a 1%, a, a, a flat, a 1% and a 2% increase? Well, let's just do 1% and 2% because we know that, you know, like Leah said, a flat isn't going to be an option because they're going to lose money, but. Okay. And, and, and maybe be a little bit more concrete about, we want some specificity about, okay, it may continue, you know, like how many options would there be? And. I, I will say that one of the reasons I voted yes on this is I know that we have worked, we heard from the community and we worked really hard to increase the quality of the food that we're serving our kids. And I felt like this was a step backwards. And, you know, we wanted fresher items and we knew that it would cost a little bit more. And so honestly understanding um, 
our budget impact on this may be helpful too overall because you know um a lot you know students are paying for these lunches as well so is that okay with everyone to ask the administration to go back to Sodexo and have tell us what does it look like if we have a one percent increase and what does it look like if we have a two percent increase not what ifs you know this would be what it would be is that are those clean parameters for you to work within? I'm good with that. As long as the majority of the board is comfortable, that will bring back what that looks like. Um, I think for the sense of time, um, we'll try to get that information put together as soon as possible. I would suggest that we bring both of those proposals forward for consideration next time. And if the board's comfortable with one of them, then we could move forward. If not, I think we need to pivot then very, very quickly. So let me ask, are there, it may be challenging right now to respond to this question, but at a 2% increase, are there four votes? Or is it more meaningful to understand what a 2% increase means? The latter for me. Okay. Okay. So. Um, we can prepare information for both of those. And then the board could make the call, you know, based on after you look at the details, which direction you'd like to go. Okay. Okay. Well, let me I, just ask, if, if the 2% is not very attractive to the board, would the board consider going back to 3% or is that totally off the table? I mean, is, is it 2% or are we find a new vendor or, um, I mean, if 2% doesn't give us what we want, then what are our options? That's a good question. I mean, we can have, I think that it sounds like what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this again on the second and if we're going to make a decision then. I would suggest that we almost have to at that point, one way or the other. Um, here's the other thing. I know I had sent some additional information to the board about the summer meal program. We had already planned to put together the summer meal program. Sodexo was the key player in this. Um, and if we no longer have them, no matter what the circumstances are, uh, we're going to have to reverse course on that as well. Uh, that will have to end on June 30th, uh, depending on where we head with this. I just want you to be aware of that. Okay. Let's um, move on in our agenda. Sorry, I just got kicked out of board docs. Give me one second here. The next agenda item is the referendum um, discussion item. So, Brian, I'll turn that over to you. All righty. Let me pull up a couple documents. Hold on a second. Chip gear, sorry. Um, all right. Well, tonight uh, we do have a document and a timeline we'd like to uh, walk through with the board in regard to our uh, construction uh, planning. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome Dennis Bain from DLR and Lance Trish from Pepper. Uh, welcome gentlemen, sorry for the delay this evening. Uh, we've had a lot of business on store here tonight, so thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, and uh, we have been doing some preliminary work, uh, the three of us as well as Craig and, and Dave on this. And, um, uh, I'm going to turn over to Craig at this point and let him talk a little bit about the details and, and the information we'd like to share with the board and get some feedback. Craig? Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Uh, as Dr. Harris mentioned, uh, we just have two items uh, to discuss with the board tonight. The first is the project schedule. Um, this uh, illustrates uh, the timing and sequence of uh, when the projects could occur at all the school sites throughout the district over the next four years. And then the second item is the formation of a new superintendent's committee called the Referendum Construction Steering Committee. And we'd like some inf input from the board on membership uh, uh, with this committee. So give me a second here. I'm going to start with that project schedule. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and pull that up. Okay. 
Okay, um, obviously the uh, construction projects will touch all of the uh, school sites throughout the district, but uh, we suggested starting uh, with the uh, two middle schools and Grow Avenue School uh, due to trying to address some of the safety items that were inherent at those sites. We've obviously had uh, the mobile classrooms for over a decade at our middle schools, and we'd like to create the permanent additions and bring those, school, those students back into the schools. Um, and then also at Grove uh, Avenue, um, we are looking at uh, creating that secure uh, entry vestibule like we have at our other school sites. So that was some of the reasoning as to uh, while the projects will touch all the buildings of why we chose those three to start. So at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dennis Bain from the DLR group who will actually walk through uh, the entire project timeline and then we can open up to feedback and questions from the board. Thank you, Craig. Um, as Craig mentioned, uh, I believe you have this all in your board packet. So just real quick how to read it. If you look at the very bottom, there's a legend that talks to the colors. And in essence, the purple is a design sequence and there's a lot of you know, milestones within that. The orange is the proposed bid uh, time in terms of when bid documents would be available and when we'd open bids. And then the red is kind of the construction uh, duration. Um, so that's kind of how you can read it. And at the very top, you can start to see how the years and the months kind of play out. And as Craig mentioned, um, there was two big aspects that we, that Lance and I used to kind of create the schedule. One was horizontally trying to make sure that we were able to design and produce a comprehensive set of bid documents for each campus as much as possible so that we could get in and get out as quickly as possible without disrupting the, the teaching and learning environment. That also helped us leverage whatever skill sets the market presented itself at the given time to leverage the skills and the resources uh, that the construction industry had. But more so than that, we really wanted to, as Craig alluded to, focus in on the safety and security issues and concerns particularly with the mobile classrooms at Prairie and Station, and then the entry, the secure entry at Grove. Um, we're proposing that we start the middle schools right out of the gate because of the size, more or less, of those projects. And then we'll quickly divert some of our teammates to the Grove Elementary School. That's a much smaller project. At the same time, we'll, we're proposing to divert some some resources to the Barrington High School, mostly on the site part. We wanna separate the site from the building. Um, and I think you already know that we are in uh, full steam ahead in terms of dealing with the pneumatic pump. It's a vital resource or piece of equipment at the in the mechanical room at the high school so that that work can take place over Christmas holiday. But we also want to start working on the site because we need to prepare the site for any building additions and renovations in the future. So we kind of have three phases going there at the high school. After that, we kind of took the elementary work and started pairing up the sister schools um, and added some additional elementary work there, trying to work out a balance in terms of some cash flow and, and Lance and the Pepper team is still working through um, some scenarios there to make sure we're not flooding the market, but also making sure we take advantage of the market. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on that. There's one line item that you'll see in here that we haven't spoken about, which is the elementary addition. Um, and I think I'll turn that over to Brian to facilitate that conversation and to address any questions. Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Um, again, Board members, as you can see, uh, we, we took the liberty as we were thinking through this and provided some context for um, the um, uh, starting out with the three facilities right away. Now, the rest of facilities were, were uh, strategically set up um, with Roslyn and Countryside as sister schools and with Rose and North Barrington as sister schools. You know, those footprints are essentially identical. So we thought we would probably be able to uh, leverage some scale there and be able to coordinate you know, efforts on both of those buildings. But the one issue that is hanging out there that we will need board direction from, doesn't have to be tonight, 
but it clearly needs to be uh, sometime in the next few uh, months is where this elementary addition is going to actually uh, take place. Um, if it's at Grove, um, then we need to incorporate that into our planning here very quickly. If it is gonna be targeted at one of the other elementary buildings, then obviously, as you can see, we have time. Um, I wanted to uh, you know, specifically point that out as really the un only unknown. Uh, we kind of threw it in there in the middle, but it was just a, a guess. And we would have to then tie that to elementary school and elementary school accordingly um, based on where the board sees that uh, addition being placed into uh, the construction mode. So um, I think at this point, I would just like the board to weigh in on what they see uh, as far as the timing, uh, ask any questions about the details of this chart and um, uh, see if there's any questions at this point moving forward, any major questions about our timeline and what we've uh, put together here as the first draft. I think this is awesome. Great job, I love it. Um, I'm trying to win points back after the last discussion. Um, so I think that, you know, my, my, and I've been wondering about these elementary additions as well. Um, and I know that we, you know, kind of went around and, and talked a lot about like, okay, if we put in, you know, one larger addition on one school versus like small additions in every school. What is the, what is the price difference? We kept kind of hearing mm, it's about the same. And I, I would love to get some, some confirmation on that because I think that that's important information. I know we're not going to discuss it tonight. So I'm just going to lob it out there as maybe something that can come back as some um, information that we can get when we're trying to decide how to navigate this. Yeah, Lance or Dennis, do you have any quick comments on that? I know it may take a little more thought, but you know whether it's a, a four classroom addition at any one building or whether we spread that among schools. Yeah, I mean, it's a great point, Angela. Um, and it's definitely something that we need to focus on because you know there's definitely more economies of scale with these, uh, with the larger the addition, you know, I and mean, we got the same thing at the elementaries with all these sensory and learning additions. These things are like a thousand square feet. They're, they're going to be expensive because, you know, they're, they're just so small. So anything we can do to kind of scale these projects up and is only going to save the district money and you know, make things a lot more efficient. So I do think, Andrew, the quick question is, you know, if we were to put the, the four classroom addition at one school, certainly there's going to be, you know, some type of cost savings there, right? If we spread one classroom across four schools, you, you know, it's going to be more, it's, yeah, you know, it's going to be more expensive. It just is. And there's probably some schools where it's much more difficult to add on than others as well. So maybe just to like, you know, get that information out so that we can all kind of think about that. Yeah, there's also some schools are conducive. Huff's not conducive to, a, to an addition. We all know that, right? Very sure. limited anyway. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Whereas, you know, a school like Rose or Countryside has a lot more flexibility on their campus, right? They just do. Mm -hmm. And then all the others are somewhere in between. So um, since that will be something we'll discuss in the future, correct? But I was wondering if the board might be interested in having the team take a look at some of the buildings where they think a four classroom addition might fit well and at a future meeting bring that to the board is that okay with everyone sure i just i just wanted to ask when we were originally conceptualizing this and maybe it was the last referendum last you know last year because grove has the the mobiles i thought we were just going to be putting the four classroom addition at grove to get rid of the mobiles was, was huh. and and if not does that mean we have to redistrict because of you know just the number of rooms that are available at each of the schools well i think that um the board was very careful about saying the goal was to remove the, make sure that no student had to be in mobiles and that what we were going to do is make sure that wherever we added on 
that it was going to help eliminate that problem, whether we add it on at four schools or two schools or one school. And so when we make that decision, we'll have to ask that question and understand what that means. Because it could mean that. Um, too early to tell. So um, how do we, Angela gave feedback. Personally, I think that this is very helpful, especially um, it will be very helpful when communicating with people in the community. I just want to, I'm just crossing my fingers that we're not trying to be over uh, overzealous and that we're very um, conservative on our timeline because I think that it's better to be conservative because if we don't hit a mark where we say we're going to deliver, um, you know, I think the community might be upset about that. So that would be my contribution, be more conservative. <laughs> so I hope that's yeah. what you reflected here. That's a great point, Penny. I, I think one of the things that I want to make sure that that we kind of hit home is we're really focusing hard right now on the Prairie Station and Grove, kind of those first three components. And then, then we're going to start to focus more on the high school and all the elementary. So kind of the order of those, you know, could juxtapose a little bit moving forward on how we tackle some of those projects. Once we start to get into the, you know, the details. We're really focusing hard on these first three projects, you know, moving forward and over this next uh, six months. I think the middle schools, Penny, to your point, are probably the most critical timelines. You see where that purple chart starts for both of those. You know, I kind of, if as much as anything tonight, if the board's in agreement with getting going on the middle schools and with Grove, I think that's the key right now. Um, and if there's any concerns, I really would like to hear it now if, if we're missing the mark here. I only have one observation. Lines is the school near station, correct? Yes. Yes. So, you know, and Lines is uh, currently last in the timeline. Can you hear me all right? My phone just did something strange. Yes, yes we can hear you. Okay, sorry. Um, so if there are any, you know, projects at Lines and Station that, I don't know, since they're both next to each other, <clears throat> I guess things like moving equipment off site and then back on, you know, or economies of scale was mentioned, you know, does it make sense to do anything sooner at lines because of what you're doing at station is one question um, and then more clarity on the numbers that lance mentioned again economies of scale would be cheaper to do things here and there some some idea of what those numbers are would be helpful uh, not just four classrooms versus one everywhere else but you know, it doesn't make sense to put three somewhere and one somewhere else. Uh, so we don't have to continue to, you know, leave the conversation and then come back with more data. Just kind of a thorough review of, you know, what the costs are and where does it make the most sense, you know, to put those four additional elementary classrooms. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? My only observation is I don't recall, and again, it's been so long since we talked about this, but I don't recall us having four classrooms added on to one elementary school. Maybe I'm totally forgetting the conversation. No, what we, okay, so we had a spatial placeholder, shall we say, yep. in our Blueprint for 20 drawings at Grove because they were trying to accommodate the students that were in the mobiles. And our commitment when we added those four classrooms onto the referendum pile of projects to do was that we, our commitment was to eliminate the mobiles at Grove by adding elementary space. That so we have not, and we were very, we were, we didn't want to be prescriptive at that time because we wanted to be able to have the conversation about 
um, where it best fit, where it best fit for enrollment, where it best fit Perfect. all those things. I, I thought we were talking about four classrooms over and above what we were talking about at Grove. So all right, I'm oh, good. No. no, no, no. It's the okay. same. They're I'm elementary good. classrooms. Good. We're good. Okay. So uh, go ahead. I guess I want to, I want to hear a little bit more about the elementary classroom before we get started on, on just doing the four at Grove. That would be me personally. So I'd like to, but I, I've been, I've been pretty consistent on this. Um, are we putting four on Grove? Are we building eight classrooms on Grove and not touching a couple other schools? No. I think we should know no. that. No. no. The idea was always to add four additional elementary classrooms somewhere in the district. Mm -hmm. right so we were going to decide post-referendum where those would be and so that's why I mean that's what I'm thinking we're asking the team and the team I'm using like the people on the screen um, to help figure out where those classrooms would best be located to meet our enrollment to financially um, all of those things, but with the end result of making sure that no elementary student was in a mobile. That is correct. That's well said, Penny. So I guess I don't understand. I thought I've heard, I heard two different things today then. So this starting on Grove means adding four classrooms at Grove? Oh. Yeah, that's where I was. I was just gonna, I think that's where there was definitely a disconnect. So in Grove Elementary, that is really the rework in the main entrance and then all of the facility assessment projects that need to be done at Grove. Um, the elementary addition is above and beyond that line item down below. That's where I, I, I don't know that we have clarified that properly, but this Grove Elementary line item, there's no addition in there. That's literally just rework in the main entrance and then all the facility assessment projects. Does that make more sense now? That makes more sense, Lance. So I was getting ready to interrupt a minute ago because I started thinking about that's probably why it kind of even goes back to Gavin's comment about additional classrooms. Sorry about that. Sorry for the confusion. Okay. Any other questions on this document? I would just update it to make sure that's clear <laughs> so we don't ask this again because we will. Well, the only update is going to be when we bring clarity on that 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 line item that says elementary addition. We would obviously, wherever we put those four classrooms, then we would add them to that school's projects. You know, I think though that probably in the near future we would probably be able to um, make make a list of everything being done at each school. We didn't we group things by level before, not by particular building. And so that might, um, well, I know I'm, you made all of those sheets for all of us. So we all know what's going yeah, on. We have everything. But, Absolutely. Um, maybe we can just, um, I'll work with you to try to put something together, even if it's, um, you know, links to those documents for board members. They're all online. Yep. You know, they're all on the district's website. Okay, I'm looking at the clock. Can we move on? Yes, the only other item we have then is just, um, obviously these projects are gonna go out to uh, 2024 and um, I'm gonna switch over to uh, the new committee I mentioned that would be um, overseeing um, the projects as they go through the different phases of design and construction. And so we wanted to uh, get some input, input from the board as far as membership on uh, the steering committee. We've uh, suggested some representatives that we think would be appropriate to uh, sit on this committee and just looking for um, some guidance from the board as far as membership. So I'll start by saying, um, I, you know, I previewed this and so I um, thought about the board of education rep and Honestly, I would like to volunteer to do it. I think my, let me tell you my thought process behind that. Every other board member is already on a committee. Um, I'm not, and then I was also part of the core committee for Blueprint 220 and then 
was um, on facilities for all that time. This is like, a, the way I see this as an umbrella committee, there will be committee um, design committees that are put together project by project by project and board members, individual board members can volunteer to be part of those committees based on the project. So if someone has an interest in say station, um, they can be on the station design committee and then move off and, or just be on the high school design committee, those types of things. So um, I, I guess I wanna know if, you know, is that okay with everyone? I support that, Penny. I think you'd be great on the committee. And um, as I said before, I think you might have just a little bit more time uh, in terms of commitment. And um, you have the background and the and the the long history with the with the district in terms of uh, um, your connection. So I, I support that. Me too. Me three. Okay. Um, Thank you. Um, I think the other thing that I, I would definitely encourage board members to be able to sign up for those design committees if you're interested in that. Um, the other thing is, I, can you can you share your screen again? Yep. With the document, um, this committee is by design. I think kept a little smaller because there will be others, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, that will flow on and off of this committee based on the project is at hand. Yeah, we will invite people depending on our agendas to join in the conversation, but this is the standing members the way I see it. And just for clarity to the board, this will be a superintendent committee uh, with a board rep on it, like we do have in a couple other scenarios. Um, and then we will, but this is the core group that's actually gonna be you know, expected to attend every meeting. Let's put it that way. And uh, and then we'll invite people to join us periodically. Yeah, you know, and, like, there's, and there is um, crossover from this committee onto all of the board committees as well in Nicole and Dave and Brian and Craig. So we thought that that was good in case something did need to go to a committee, um, that there would be that communication. So, um, any ideas beyond what's been proposed right now? Is there any thought given yet to a link to facilities committee other than that Dave and Nicole come to those meetings or on those committees? Well, I, when I thought about that, I thought, you know, I think the facilities committee has a lot of work to do already and adding more work on to the, to your committee, um, didn't, didn't seem right. And so I think that in terms of representation messages going back and forth or continuity of information, certainly Dave and Nicole and Brian would be those people. Of course, I guess I just assumed that facilities was gonna have more work based on the work of the referendum. Won't mm -hmm. they, either, won't they, won't we either way? I'm not sure. I, I think facilities is still gonna have summer projects to be taken care of and, um, you know, you, someone already, you mentioned this evening already, the work, you know, the Hart Road property possibilities, um, you know, possibilities of trying to find a place to house maintenance. Those are all things that will still fall under facilities. So there is overlap. I mean, because Hart Road is directly tied to what we're doing with the referendum. So, um, right. yeah. And that's, that's why, I mean, there's administration on both committees. The same thing will happen with finance too. I mean, when we start doing the bonding work, we're going to have to run stuff through finance. I mean, communication is going to be key. You know, this is kind of a standalone project. All the projects have been identified here. Um, there really is no flowing out. Now there'll be some decisions to be made, but that'll be key that uh, 
myself and Craig and Dave will be, you know, uh, have to keep all board members up to speed as there's crossover. And certainly if there's something that, um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly happy to go back and forth between the two committees as well. Um, okay, so everybody's okay with kind of the structure right now. And as we move forward on this, I think you'll start to see that um, the reports from the committee will you know, include other people periodically based on whatever is being worked on. I'll move over to Penny. Let's move on. Okay. Okay. Um, anything else on this agenda item? Uh, the last thing I want to mention, just thank you for the feedback tonight. And then um, we are going to start retooling uh, the referendum link on our website to start to shift from the campaign to more of the construction and creating uh, tabs that then would help provide um, insight into the work as it's being completed and the finances around it and so forth. So we'd start to retool that and we'll bring that update to the board uh, at a future meeting. Okay, thank you. Any, uh, is it okay for us to move on everybody? Thanks Dennis, thanks Lance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, back to, um, Where's Dave? Is Dave back on? Yes. Okay, yes you are. Okay, um, we'd like to revisit some of those models that you've been able to build. I know this is going late you guys, but you just have some stuff. So you should be able to see uh, my screen with uh, you know, a chart that looks familiar for you. I've got uh, two different ones. This is uh, the one that has the 98.5 tax collection rate. Um, it, you know, these, are, these scenarios are the same with the exception of the tax collection rate. So, um, so this is uh, what this looks like. Uh, what, what you can see here in fiscal 21, um, is actually that, uh, you know, according to the model, we would actually have a slight increase in fund balance um, that would happen. Um, and when we take a look at the 97.25 uh, model, uh, what you can see is that we actually have about a, um, a $1.6 million uh, drop in, uh, in fund balance um, that would happen uh, looking at, at 21. So and I know that uh, I heard the board say we really wanted to focus uh, just on one year out. So I'm not talking about the balance of um, of that. So so I have both of those for you know for you, um, you know, to the extent you're interested um, in seeing uh, this version. You know here you can see um, in the 97.25 model. You know right over here um, is the approximate 1.6 million dollar deficit. Um, that uh, you could see graphically as well on the drop. Um, and then here is uh, that, that same chart uh, for the 98.5 model, um, which shows um, a surplus in 21. Okay. Um, is this the information that you're looking for, board members? This reflects all of the other changes, the zeroing out, the tightening up of summer projects, Yes, so what I did is I adjusted uh, new construction, um, interest assumptions, I put in 0% growth in the Ed Fund for purchase services, capital and supplies, 0% uh, growth in um, uh, those categories in operations and maintenance. Um, in uh, transportation, I took uh, supplies to 1% um, and I reduced um, the O&M capital expense uh, down by $400,000 reflected decline in summer projects. Okay. Um, can I make a suggestion? And I'm looking for board feedback. Um, Dave, could you please go back to the 97.25 um, chart like this? This? The, no, with the numbers, please. Oh, sorry, with the numbers. There we go. The chart, my mistake. Okay, so this shows a one point 
five. I'm sorry, I can't see any larger than that. Um, thank you. We'll call it a 1.6 um, deficit. Um, would it be, how would board members feel about asking Dr. Harris and his staff to um, bring us some possible budget reductions um, in like up up to two million dollars for this coming year for us to review at our next meeting. Penny, could we tear it the way we have in the past? Like, yeah, I would, I would hope. So in the past, what we've done is, you know, we would have said a $500,000 reduction, um, 1 million, 1 1.5 to, to, I would, that would be nice. I would hope that um, you could give up, provide those budget reductions um, in some order of priority. Um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, I've done it before. Uh, yeah, I just, I wanted to clarify to make sure everybody's come. We can do it in uh, $500,000 increments, if that's okay. We'll do a 500,000, a million, a million five, and two million. And we'll prioritize those in that order. And these are reductions beyond what is modeled. Is that just to, just to clarify? Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay, is that okay with everybody? Yeah, just for clarity, the, to reinforce Dave's point, that'll be things on top of what we already decided tonight. Okay, I'm gonna ask it another way. Is there anyone opposed to doing this? Okay. No opposition here. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this puts us Thank you, Dave, for doing this for us because this puts us a, a a week ahead of where we were, or a, a meeting ahead of where we were if we had waited until next time. So thank you, board members, for the extra time we put into this tonight, um, and for Dave for for being prepared to do all of that too. Um, I have to get my screen back here. Okay, um, are there any other agenda items no no penny i just want to comment on one thing um one of the challenges that we'll be looking at uh bringing those reductions forward is staffing um you know we've got we have several hires that are on hold right now um and uh, i am concerned on some of those uh if if the board's okay with this we would probably uh, go ahead and move forward with what we would interpret as critical hires um, that are on that list that we shared with you. There's a few of them that are critical and the ones that you will probably see included in, in this, you know, document that I, that you just asked me to put together. Um, and we just need some staff time to talk through that. I couldn't tell you tonight what that's going to look like, but um, I, I just would like a little latitude uh, for the personnel report next month because that'll be June 2nd and we, if there are a few of those staff members that we know uh, you know that we're waiting on resignations for other districts things like that or if we might lose critical candidates uh, that we've identified through our hiring process I just would ask for a little bit of latitude there if that's okay with the board. Does anybody object to that? My only objection, Brian, is is we've got to find a way to meet these thresholds. And if, if we have FTEs that we haven't filled at this point, we need to take them into account. Absolutely. Would, and so, Brian, as you put your list, you know, your as you contemplate building these tiers, um, factor that in. Absolutely. And, you know, we would have it on the personal report next time. And if we tabled the personnel report till after this discussion, you know, that, that that's fine. Although we'll try to be very careful, um, you know, that anything we would put on there, we would not have on this list is what I'm saying. Well, I can't tell you tonight, 
but that's what we would obviously try to manage carefully. Okay. Just be careful because the personnel report is, is what it is. I don't want to. I don't want to put the board in a position where we're going to be forced to vote no because of a budgetary issue. So just, no, I I, I'm, I'm deferring to you at this point. I I understand. I won't do that. Okay. Um, agenda items for June second. Let's keep it light. <laughs> I hear you. We're going to talk about this again. Um, and my guess is we'll have a, we may have a referendum construction update, but um, is there anything else we need to add at this time to next month's agenda? Okay. Um, is there a motion? Sorry, to Penny, only if it impacts the start of school, we'll, we'll be covering that. Right? New information. That would, that would That'll probably, be on our agenda every time <laughs> till okay. future notice. Let's put it All that right. way. Is there a motion to maintain the confidentiality of closed session minutes from last Tuesday, May 12th? Angela, and, so moved. And, and this evening. Second. So yeah. moved. Mike, second. Roll call, please. Angela Wilcox? Yes. <laughs> Barry Altshuler? Yes. Sandra Bradford? Yes. Penny Casimir? Yes. Gavin Newman? Yes. Leah Collister Lazari? Yes. Mike Shackleton? Yes. Is there a motion to finally adjourn? <laughs> Angela, <Yes>. so moved. <laughs> we a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you for your patience tonight. I do think we accomplished a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night.